you're listening to the Getting Salty Experience Podcast. Hello! Hello! Pee-wee down in Jersey. And also 21 Truck Filament. I'll give the two shortest guys I know. A little shout out tonight. I feel tall around those guys. No, real. I was going to say, don't forget I'm, yourself. What do you got? An inch on them? I was going to say, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> an inch is an inch, bro. You know an inch saying? is an inch. That's what she said. Yeah, you ain't kidding, bro. <laughs> you know how you get that? You know how you get that extra inch? No. You you pull your balls back. <laughs> <laughs> really? That's that's Gonzo, it's a family <laughs> show, Gonzo. Oh, what? Mm-hmm. Since when? <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Sorry, folks. Uh, Unbelievable. He gets a haircut, he feels froggy. Bro. That's what happened. We we made fun no, of his I'm, hair last week, and that, yeah. that you know you knew it was a guarantee. It was easy money. That was you know even was, money. You know was like that too. A certain other little, little uh, producer that we used to have, we would pummel him on something, and God, I know for sure the next show, the <laughs> something will be changed, right? Remember? Yeah, no he, doubt about it. We would, oh, we pummeled him hard, bro. We used to pummel him. That was funny shit. Just, Maybe I'm it's the you. Jews. It, it, Pete's not Jew. Oh, his wife is Jewish too. It's the half Jew, maybe. Oh, it's the, only, only, the, only the good. Only the good half. <laughs> We've been decorating, uh, decorating the tree. Uh, Mazel yeah. tov, John. Mazel tov. Yeah. <laughs> you uh, dick. You got the candelabra up? Is the candelabra up and working, bro? Yeah, I think tonight's the last night. Hopefully, tonight's sure. the last night. I think so. Isn't it eight crazy nights or some shit? Did the old lady get you something every night? No, no, negative. No, no, no. no. We save everything. Stuff? No, no. <laughs> no. What's going on? <laughs> hey, you play spin the dreidel. No, it's always the kids, you know. The I'm kids, playing, you know, I'm playing spin the dreidel, anything like that. Uh, I was actually looking. I thought I had a dreidel here. I was going to spin dreidel, it. Dreidel, dreidel, dreidel. <laughs> I'm sorry, I don't have it. Maybe I'll so, find. You're, you're going to double dip, and you're going to celebrate Christmas too. Yeah, I don't double dip. The kids double dip. I don't. You know, I you we don't celebrate you, together. See, that's a good answer. That's a good answer. Uh, yeah. Gonzo double pays. He don't double dip. <laughs> <Exactly>. <laughs> double pays. It's right. You ain't. He's you ain't on lying. the wrong end of that. Yeah, yeah, no yeah. Doubt. You ain't lying. He ain't lying. <laughs> Stuff. Ruffy must be freezing cold up there. You don't got a parker on though. What's up? You turn your heat on? No, it's been uh I'm getting acclimated. It's been the 30s. Yeah. Like three What's up days in the hanging on the uh, on the uh, drapes there? Is that like a decoration or something? What is yeah, that? That's from his daughter from way back when. You gotta decorate My daughter put that up. He did. Remember it's last year? Candy. Same thing. They were there last year, right? They put them in the same spots. What's the plate you got there? What is that? That's from the union. Oh, look at that. It's the plate you used to sit on when you should drive the rig. Oh, me? <laughs> oh, oh. My daughter got me this one for last Christmas, too. No trespassing due to the high cost of ammo. <laughs> no warning shot. <laughs> nice. Where's the big board that Frankie made you? It's right in front of me. Ah, nice. Good stuff. Well, when can I expect my uh, venison hot dogs? <clears throat> uh, when I see you. Like the show or something? When we go to the show in February? I could do that. Yeah, see that? It's good stuff. All right, we got to play a couple of uh, commercials here, and then we'll get right into it. All right. Here we Paul go. Charging 252 captain coming on tonight, here, bro. Here we go. All right. He's got a lot of good stories. He does. He wanted to keep going while we're going over the pictures. I'm like, got to save it. Got to save it. Yeah. So anyway, here we go from New Jersey Fire. Established in 1930 and under the current ownership since 1987, the New Jersey Fire Equipment Company handles a complete line of fire department equipment and supplies. Headquartered in Greenbrook, the company operates full 3M Scott service facilities in Ridgefield Park and Toms River, staffed by 10 fully authorized Scott certified technicians with a fleet of six fully equipped service vans. All New Jersey fire technicians and sales representatives are active or retired firefighters, officers or chief officers, career and volunteer. They understand the business and the importance of their work. New Jersey Fire has represented Scott since Earl Scott entered the SCBA business at the end of World War II. Among other leading manufacturers represented by New Jersey Fire are Globe and Firedex Turnout Gear, Mercedes Hose, Task Force Tips and Akron Brass, Hygienol, Fire Hooks, Arctic Compressors, MSA Carnes Helmets, ChemGuard Foam, Alkalite and Duo Safety Ladders, BA Face Shield Protectors, Truckman's Choice Saws, Grove's gear racks and washer dryers, SuperVac fans, RPI, Streamlight, and many others. 
A New Jersey incorporated and based company, sales and service are limited to the state of New Jersey. Find us now at www.njfe.com. That's www.njfe.com. A little shout out to my boy Jose Martinez. He's back. He's back. Polish Princess mm-hmm. and uh, Robbie Procaccino's in there. Yeah, yeah. Somebody mentioned my hair. I was like, well, look at that, Rob. Yeah. My hair. yeah. <laughs> I just spoke to Jimmy the Guinea the other day from the Jersey Fire. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. On, uh, a cowboy Newark. fan, right? I think. Yeah, this kid's getting on the Newark Fire Department. Yeah, that I know. He's doing some work. It's good. Good stuff. All right, let's play the next commercial so we get this guy in here, man. All right, here we go. They saved New York. It is a book that will perhaps go down as the report from Engine Company 82 of our generation. They Saved New York, written by Glenn Uston and Dan Potter, a retired New York City firefighter, explores the men and women of the FDNY and their respective journeys into the department. From everyone, from firefighters on the fire floor to those who were in positions of command, such as lieutenant, captain, and chief, and so on and so forth, this book explores their stories told through their perspectives. Each story differs, but the mission is the same. And the common theme is this. Those that put their lives in the line to save their fellow New Yorker, no matter the cost, no matter the situation, whenever they were in need. Get your hands on this book today. You will not regret it. Written by, once again, retired New York City firefighter Dan Potter and the concept of photography provided by the one and only Glenn Usden, a member of the Firebell Club in New York City. They saved New York, the men and women of the FDNY. If you'd like to purchase the book, you can do so at theysavedny.com. That is, again, www.theysavedny.com. Yeah, and you can buy it on Getting Salty Apparel as well. You know, I got to talk to Mike. I love that. You ever notice the background music in that? It sounds like Soul Glow. You got to let your soul glow. Like, <laughs> you know, Mr. Randy. Like, Mr. Randy. Mr. Randy and Washington yeah. coming to the stage. <laughs> like, where did he get that background music? You know what? I didn't even realize that. Actually. You yeah. Did you? But that's when you notice at the end of it is when his ball drops because he gets real deep. Like he gets that real like got me big deep deep tonight. No one bench press six ninety. <laughs> Going to my battery white monitor now. That's there, what it is. <laughs> All right, Ruff. Let's, let's do get this. Captain in here tonight. Ready, God. I, I, I looked at him. I looked at him down there, and I looked up, and it said uh, 252 guys watching live. So what a coincidence, right? Oh, mm-hmm. look at that! What a number! All right, yeah, coming to the stage, Captain Tony Trakarico. Looking good, what cap? I took my dreidel away. Yeah. <laughs> ah, dreidel, dreidel, dreidel. I told you, Steve, we, we were in cahoots right. with that right. one. He's got Appreciate that. Hair you, guns. I'm telling you right now. Oh, he does got good hair still. Oh, my hair's my turn my hair. He always had good hair. Uh, the, Cap, how are you? About, speaking about the book, uh, Cap, well, Cap goes in the book. Yeah, yeah. They actually got a couple of things wrong in my on my page, but that's all right. You know, the, the fact that they even asked me was honored to be to be with that level of firefighter out there. Those are some of the best. And, uh, I was honored just to be in that crowd. Yeah, I was talking to who we have on the other night. Uh, um, Mo Mo Davis. Okay, and he was saying the amount the guys in that room that right right when we were doing the book signing. Yeah, yeah. just amazing amount of uh, history and talent, and those guys were hard chargers, man. And what, what got me was the fact that people wanted me to sign their book. I was looking for people to sign my book. My book. I was astounded that people would even ask me. You know who's there, Ruff? Ed. Oh, yeah? Yeah. Okay. I call him Chief Kilduff. You call him Ed. Hey, Ed. Him Ed. Ed. Me and Eddie. <laughs> you and Eddie were doing it. <laughs> He's a great guy, man. Eddie Kilduff. Oh, the yeah. first time I spoke to him. Two engine. We had some good work together over that way. And then as a chief officer, of course, I you know, oh. worked with him several times. He, uh, Compliment when he signed my book. It was uh, he's just a dynamite cat. Oh, he's a sweetheart. And the best, I, I was only talking to him a couple minutes, and I'm like, Chief, this, Chief, you know. And he's like, Lou, you can call me Ed. I'm like, uh, yeah, Chief, that's never gonna happen. <laughs> Chief, Chief Ed. You're calling me Lou, Chief. why can't I call you Chief? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Are you calling me Lou or right. you calling me Lou? Exactly. All right, All right guys, let's get patriotic before we get into Sir. the uh, cat and so the surreal. All right, here we go. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all.
There you go. Pee Wee's asking about the pizza cutter. That's not coming till after the holidays. Sorry, brother. But it's on its way. I think Lou railroaded it a little bit. What? Did I say that out loud? (laughs) (laughs) All right. I don't know you, Chief. I did that last time. I called you, Chief. I promoted you again. Yeah. So let's go back to uh, your early life, where you grew up, uh, you know, family life in the beginning. And then uh, you said you got into the uh, military, went to the Air Force. So tell us about the, uh, the early life. Well, I uh, born in Crown Heights, Brooklyn, in June of 56. We were living at the time on Washington Avenue, right at the Botanical Gardens. Uh, a few years later, my parents moved to Linden Boulevard, a little further south. And the final place we lived in Brooklyn, believe it or not, was right at uh, Bedford and Newkirk, right in one Oh, my Coast God. I know. It was nice at the time. It's crazy that you end up working there, too, for God's I, sake. I know. It was a different world back then, too. Oh, you my, my God. Say, I was only six years old. And my mom would say, go downstairs and play. You just can't leave the, uh, the front of the building. And it was two sister buildings, so I just played in front of the buildings with whoever was out there playing. You know, and that's what we did. My grandma, my mom's mom, was right down the road on Kenilworth Place at 120 Kenilworth Place. And uh, so we, my father, my parents would walk us down and we couldn't. She, We'd go to her house and hang out up there. And she'd uh, give me a quarter and call up Ruthie downstairs at a, a mall shop. And I'd go down there and whatever it cost for the quarter, I guess, probably a nickel at the time. Um, Ruthie would come up. She'd pinch my, Anthony, how are you? She'd give me a hug and she'd put me on one of the stools and make me a nice big vanilla malted, the real, real vanilla malted. So she lived mm-hmm. over there. And um, then it was the 60s, so my my grand my parents were born in Manhattan, and my grandfather had a building at 341 East 24th Street, and <clears throat> it was called Tricks Bar and Grill, and uh, you know a bunch of gindaloons in there, and they they would have to have a good time. The family lived above, and he the place was just it was getting bad. The Lower East Side was getting bad, and um, he just decided to sell, and he moved out to Brentwood, Long Island, and one by one everybody went out there except my uncle Chet. Chet today he went out to. Um, Red Brick, Red Brick, New Jersey, something like that. Red oh, Bank. Brick, Brick. Red, is it Red Bank? So something like that. He lived out there. It was pretty rural out there. So we moved out there, and I went to school out there. Um, Seventy four comes around, graduated high school. Used to play in the rock and roll band, you know, head down to here the whole bit. What did and you play? Band, what what, what instrument did you play? Haircut, get a job. Get I mom, mom. I play in a band on the weekends. It's not a job. Get a haircut, get a job. So <laughs> what, band, what did you what did you play, Cat? You on the guitar? You singing? And I still, I still have a six string I play over here, like an acoustic. I just putter around, you know. So um, get a job, get a haircut, get a job, get a haircut. So I just decided I went to the military. I talked to the different guys. I talked to the Navy, but I, I, I swim like a rock, so I don't, didn't think that was a good idea. And uh, I went to the Marine Corps because my father enrolled us in the Junior Marine Corps at like 10 years old, 11 years old. And we were in there till we were 15 years old. You know, I love the Marine Corps. And I want to fly jet planes. I want to be a jet fighter pilot. And they says, well, you maybe can fly helicopters. And I was like, ah, I want to fly jets. So I went to the Army, no good. Went to the Air Force, yeah, no problem. Yeah, you got it. Come on in, take the test, you're in. So I joined the Air Force. And I came home and told my mom. I said, Mom, I'm getting handcuffed and I got a job. <laughs> All in one swoop. Yeah. And she was she was actually angry with me because the Vietnam War was still on. And she's like, I'm going to send you to Canada. And I, my father's like, you're not sending my kid to Canada. So that anyway, I went into the Air Force, had a good time. I took a, an aptitude test and I didn't score high enough to get picked to go to um, go to uh, um, flight school. So I ended up being a truck driver. That's what I did. I drove wreckers and tractor trailers and school bus and and and, and the military's same way of thinking. Um, I was assigned to base operations at, once I got my license to drive a bus. Now I'm only in the Air Force a short time, and I got to drive all the way around the flight line to pick up the the pilots all the time. I drop the pilots off. So a plane comes in and I'm like, well, why can't I just go this way? <clears throat> Nobody told me about the red lines on a tarmac. Well, I'm driving along, and all of a sudden, I see all these MPs, the SPs, they're running around with their guns. I'm like, oh, something's going on. Yeah, <laughs> yeah you. They yeah, right right on on that. Yeah, and uh, they took me away, and my, my uh, co- company commander, my squadron commander had to come and get me. So they take me off of base ops. I'm 18 years old. They take me off of base ops, and they give me a job driving a school bus for the high school. Duh. <laughs> you put an 18 year old kid driving a school bus with 18 year old kids. Anyway, it was a very fruitful event. I don't. Yeah, so, I know. I know. It was. I'm a school bus driver. Get on. I know. It's me. I told you I'm the school bus driver. My father's a colonel. I don't give a shit who your father. Just shut up. Yeah. So um, I come out of the Air Force in '76. And I, I picked up this old 1952 pickup truck. I put everything I own, my motorcycle, everything in the back of the pickup truck, and I drive home. 
And I get there, and this guy, Billy Hamlin, was a Brentwood fireman. He's like, hey, why don't you join the Volleys? Like, I don't want to hang around with those pencil necks. And he was, um, he was pretty adamant about it. And so I went there, and I, got, I talked to the trustees, and they said there was a waiting list. And a couple of days later, my father says, so you want to be a volunteer fireman? He knew everybody, my father. And uh, I said, I'll give it a shot. So he says, I know somebody. So the, the chairman oh, of the board. Like, like, you know somebody? Yeah, like, right down. Yeah, so the chairman of the board of friends, mm -hmm. and friends, I get a phone call about a week later. I go for the interview. In January 777, I become a volunteer fireman. There's your boy, Billy, right? That's, that's Billy Havlin right there, driving the rescue. He's the guy who started me on a trajectory that got me the, the, the best job in the world. Yeah. Yeah. Is yeah, that was, amazing yeah, how that happens, Captain? One guy. Every, every guy. <laughs> Well, he started Everything. me on a trajectory. So I become a Brentwood fireman, and I'm into it about six or seven months, and I walk into the main headquarters building, and there's, there's all these guys sitting around a table, and it's like Danny Potter's one of them, Phil Buffer, Mike McKeefe, Morris, um, Hutner, and anyhow, so, um, oh, we got an application for the New York City Fire Department. I didn't even know there was a paid fire department. I mean, I lived in the city for a while. I was always in the city with my grandparents or my aunts and my uncles. Crazy. That never crossed my mind. And uh, I almost didn't take it because I forget what the filing fee was, but I'm making $100 a month, you know, $100 a week rather. And they're charging, I don't know, $30 a file or something. And I'm like, come on, you cheap bastard. And I got the job. <laughs> I got the job. Yeah, it was great. So it wasn't even you that was kind of like saying, I want to take that job. It was, hey, we got an application. You might as well throw it in the, in the mix type of thing. Yeah, well, it's funny Phil Buffer called me today, and uh, he, he was saying to me about how God, God works in strange ways, and you were guided into that position. Right. And even Patty Walsh, Patty Walsh. So <laughs> I'm going to take the medical. I scored good on the unwritten. So I'm going to take the physical test. And um, that being the knucklehead that I was, I was out the night before and till two or too late in the morning, too early in the morning. And Patty Walsh comes to my house and bangs on the door and he says, my mom, that I'm here to take uh, Tony to the uh, to the, the fiscal. She's like, he's in there. Go get him. I go without me, go without me. He drags my whole bed and everything, drags me, drops me on the floor and says, I am going into Brooklyn by myself. You're coming with me. <laughs> and uh, he's another one to say. So that was, you were that close to not getting the job like that. You wouldn't, you wouldn't even have taken the physical, right? I mean, it's crazy. Was one shot away from not taking that physical. <laughs> That's right. One it's jack like, from not going. Happened. One jack and coke away from. <laughs> Probably tequila. Tequila makes one eye go this way, one eye go this uh, way. <laughs> my clothes will walk. So, so you took the test the uh, with the walk in the ledge and all that. We talked to a couple of guys around the era, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. The walk in the ledge. Oh, and all that thing, carrying the dummy up and down the stairs. They said mm -hmm. that was the last of the Superman tests. Yeah. And then everything changed. <clears throat> right. So yeah. how, what, what year did you take it? it like, 77. You took it in 77. They called yeah. you in 81. Right, right. Probably should have gone around 79, but they stopped hiring because of a lawsuit. Right, um, right. Women were suing, suing for the uh, job, and uh, so they didn't start hiring again. I believe July of '81 they started hiring again. And what were you doing in the meantime? I was a computer program analyst, believe it or not. What? I, I, what? I, I, Nerd alert! What? I had to ask my grandkids how to work my phone, and I used to write code. <clears throat> yeah, I knew nine different languages, and uh, I was pretty good at it. I actually worked with the Royal Blood Banking System. That was a mess, and I debugged that whole thing. Got it working really well, and. Um, I asked for a raise. I was making seventeen thousand dollars, just almost what a fireman was making, seventeen thousand dollars a year. And the boss wouldn't give me a raise. And so I said, you know what? I'm gonna give him what he's giving me. So I'd come in a half hour later, leave a half hour early, I'd take an hour and a half for lunch. And um he calls me in his office and tells me I'm on double secret probation now. You you're not showing mm -hmm. up anymore. I says, after what I did, I'm just looking for a few extra dollars a week. <coughs> Excuse me. So he um he gives me this um ultimatum. And the next day, I get the little card in the mail. Says you've been hired by New York City Fire Department in big black letters. Do not quit your job. I, will <laughs> <laughs> I never liked you. <laughs> I'm giving my two weeks notice, boss. I'm out of here. So my manager walks and says, "You can't." I had a corner office I shared with one guy, and, and my manager walks in and he's, uh, he's like, "You can't do that. You got to do this. You got to do flow charts. You got to get this set up." I said, "I'll get to it," which I didn't. But so that then uh, I became a fireman. And you know John Sullivan from 175 Truck? Anybody know him? He, he I think he did almost 40 years on the job. He and I, I we got interviews together. We got our medicals together. Everything we did, we must have been like right next to each other as far as uh, um, numbers goes. We were just over 2,000. And actually, Bob Dolney, rest in peace, Bob Dolney was killed in a collapse in uh, 233 um, in the 70s. Um, he said to me, 2,000, you might not make it. They only take about 1,500 guys, right? But they didn't know they were going to be hiring 300 at the clip. Right. 
So you didn't. So you get in there. Who who were you in Proby school with? Anybody else? That uh... um, to my right was Ramundi, and to my left was Turner. There's so many big names: the uh, um, Werner, uh, McCormick. Uh, there's so many. There was 300 people, and we were right. split session, no less. So it was A to M and N to Z. So the guys with A to M, you didn't get, get to know those guys because you know they were coming and they were leaving when you were coming, or vice versa. Right. So wow. you get out of Proby school and. And you go to 42 engine. Yep. Before uh, I get out of Cobra school, I got to tell you this. We, were, we all had <coughs> we all had the pea coats and the watch caps, and we all looked the same. You know, we all looked the same. Well, it's dusk out, or maybe just a little darker than dusk. And I'm in the building one, and I says to these two guys that are with me, I says, I'm going to jump out the window into the net. Oh, what are you crazy? Don't do that. I says, why? It's supposed to catch people. I jump out of the building into the net. No big deal. We leave. The next morning at Roll Call, Dudley Glass was in charge. I want to know who jumped out of the king. And uh, the two guys are there, and I'm looking like this, and I'm looking like this, and I'm saying they better not open their mouth. And they didn't. Good men. Good men. There, there, <laughs> there are no rats there, bro. Come on, Gans. Don't you have a rats thing? A what? Rat? A rat. Dirty? No, I don't have a dirty rat one, no. What? You no. dirty rat. You I'll, dirty I'll, rat. I'll, I'll make a note of it for you right now. Right. Right. <laughs> That's what he needs, another friend. Nobody pinched you. <laughs> Oh man, you, know, you like my sound effects, and then you don't like my sound effects. What's well, the matter you for you? The one with Henry didn't pinch anybody. You know what I mean? No, yeah. no. I so, Cap, how did you? Uh, did you put the, uh, the fix always... in? I'm sorry, Louis. What's that? Did you put the fix in for the uh, for 42? Or Actually, was no, I did not. But as I got older in the job, later in the years, I realized that. My father was probably working behind the scenes. I knew it. I was going to say that again. <laughs> he was a lumberman. Mr. Like, Caracol like, took care of shit, bro. You know what I mean? Owen McCaffrey was a pretty pretty popular guy back in the uh, 60s, 50s, 60s, 70s. And uh, and he, you know, he, he, he and uh, my father were good friends. And I think Owen McCaffrey was probably watching out for me. He was probably uh, watching out for me. I just what, didn't what, realize it at the time. I thought what did your dad do for a living, by the way? Pardon me? What did dad do for a living? He was a lumberman. He worked mm -hmm. in lumber Lumberman, a.k.a. a, uh, what do you call the it? Fixer. A collector? Oh. Frankie the Fixer. <laughs> he had, a, he had a, his own little store there, and I would go. They had the old – he taught me how to do math. Math was the most important thing to my father. I guess that's why computers made so much sense to me. It's just logic. Um, but he had the old cash machines there that you had to push. Like it was $1.52, like that. You'd have to ching, like that, and how to make – you get a five. It's $2.25, 26 cents, 26, 7, 8, 9, 30. Dimes, quarters, all of that. So he was—he taught me a lot that way. Hmm. And he took care of a lot of things, right, Roof? And I think he did. Uh, yeah, hey, forty-two engine is at, at that time in eighty-one was probably uh, no slouch, you might say. <laughs> forty-two. Yeah, yeah, he was Three. a pretty good guy. I saw my father once. I uh, had a birthday party. I was kind of twelve years old, and we're living in Brentwood, on Hilltop Drive. And this um, this family down the road, there was this guy Danny McGraw, who was way bigger than me, and he was just a bully, and. Um, I had a sh button up shirt on and he just, like ripped it and I came home and all my buttons were off and my father's like, what the hell happened to you? And I, I'm trying to be nice about it, but, um, <coughs> excuse me, but uh, I tell him that Danny grabbed me and ripped my shirt and threw me on the ground and kicked me. My father goes out there, starts talking to Danny. And now Danny's father comes out and now my father starts talking to Danny's father and Danny's father pushes my father. Boom, my father hits him. Here come the people out of my, out of Danny's house, three different guys. My father was a boxer in the army, right? He just stood there and they come up, pop. <laughs> all four of them were laying on the ground in no time. I was like, oh, that's my dad. That's yeah, my man. dad. Hell yeah. yeah he's Who's up there doing it? He's doing it. <laughs> hey, Cheese Man wants to know if you have a handkerchief hanging out the back of the rear of your pocket. <laughs> <laughs> there you go, Cheese. You are straight. You got it, bro. I always have my bandana. <coughs> nope. Can't Got to put it back in, too. So who, who was in 42 when you got there? And what was it like walking in there? Had they have a Kobe in a while? Or? Okay, I walk into 42 Engine, right? You, they, you get your assignment, you go to go right to the company. I walk in, and now 56 truck used to be in the 42 Engine, but in July of 81, they got lifted out of there by this chief, I believe his name was Waldron, in the 6th Divi 7th Division. And they got put in 48 truck, 48 Engine. So a 56 truck was defined. This guy, Steve McQueen, was a union guy, and he was always hit, him and Waldron. So um, 56 truck was there. They parked out front. I come walking in. I knock on the door. They open the door and they send me to the kitchen. I come walking in there and they just lit me up. The first guy, Kevin Kalani, as a matter of fact, was the first guy. 
who the fuck are you, you cute little blonde haired blue eyed boy? <laughs> and they just lit me up. And I'm, I'm standing there at attention and they're killing me, man. They're just tearing me up. Now, unbeknownst to me, this guy, Bob Salmon, also gets assigned a 42 engine. So he comes walking in there. Now, I'm, I'm in there several minutes now. These guys are tearing me up. And Kasama comes walking in, and now they turn to him. And what the fuck are you doing here? He says, my name's Bob Kasama, and I'm not Jewish. They took him. <laughs> <laughs> they him up, man. And I, I'm standing at attention, and I just kind of looked over at him, and I thought to myself, thanks, man. He took me right out of the pile. Right? Keep it in your mouth. Lighting Keep it in your bro. mouth. That was the five six battalion at the time. Boss yeah. ran his whole career down there. We the have uh, uh, what is a proby? I no, have... 42 engine. He spent several years in 42. Oh, you. I want to know if we have any pictures of you when you were probing in 42. What I, I have, have I, I have this one. Okay. Oh, oh wow, guy, man. Yeah, with the light in the helmet, everybody had those lights. The Garrity, no, man. No wonder they were sweet on you. Look at you. <laughs> well, look. The, uh, man, you were a baby. Holy shit. He I didn't was. last too long because this is what ended up uh, having it last. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. Just because we had a coffin, a fire in a coffin factory. That's you have to do that, right? I mean, you got to do that. You got to yeah, lay in that. Yeah. Yeah. And, and there was this old time of John Ricks, right? He was a thin black dude who lived in Harlem. And he had a real high voice and he used to carry a Bowie knife on him, like, like this big Bowie knife on his hip. And he would turn around and he'd pull out his knife because we were being too noisy. He'd be laying on the couch watching television. He, he, I don't know how many years he had. He looked like he had, I don't know, 110, 115 years. He just looked <laughs> old, old, old. And he would pull out that knife. Now, we're all kids. We've got a lot of probes before he he pull that knife out. He'd go, I'm going to cut you white motherfuckers up and chase you around the firehouse with this Bowie knife. <laughs> This is just the way he was. I drove home a couple of times. I drove him out to home a couple of times, and he got out there. And every he knew everybody in the streets. He was a tough old bird boy. And was he the senior? Guy, was he the senior guy there? Who, who were some of the senior guys there? Well, actually, Louis Piccoli and Freddie Beanman were the senior guys. They got on him about the end of the fifties or something. And the stories they told, like Freddie Beanman tells me once, right? He got stories. He says now he got on a job in the fifties. So yeah, he got on a job in the fifties. So his senior man got on a job in the 30s, whose senior men got on in the teens, tens, right? And he says, this is how the stories get passed on. So he starts telling me about house watch and taking care of the horses. And, he, you know, okay, so he's telling me about that. He says, in the night watch, the midnight watch, he says, what they do is they roll up a ball of paper and stick it in the horse's asshole so it wouldn't shit. So then when you had to relieve, they pull up, they go upstairs and wake the guy up. They come down, pull the paper out, and within 15 minutes, the horse was taking shit, and the other guy had to clean it up. And I'm like, how do they do this shit? How I've they never heard of that, bro. I have never heard that story. Oh, no. Billy Beanman had some great stories. He really did. He was an all-timer. Got on a job, like I say, in the 50s. And that's how we pass the stories on, from one to the other to the other, right? Yeah, yeah. Hell yeah. That's freaking yeah. hilarious. I never heard that. Either. The stories oh. they told, the shovel in the coal, the basements. They, they still had a knife net in 42 engines basement when I got there. That what? Life net. Really? Yeah. Yeah. What? Well, what? Well, were they really killing it then? Like, were they going to a, a ton of work in the eight, eight, in eighty one? I mean, obviously yeah, they were, right? First, okay. So I, I'm gonna I'm gonna preface this with I was a brand new kid on the job. Okay. I went to six fires my first night. Right now, it's your first night. <laughs> my first night. Here. I had I had my first fire probably an hour and a half, two hours into the into the my first night. So I had a job, and Neil Taylor was on the line. So, okay, I go up the stairs, find a fourth floor, six-story multiple dwelling, H-type building, big building. Go up there to the fourth floor, put the hose on, hose line on the table, on the uh, stair, put my knee on. I take my helmet off. I start putting my face piece on. Now, Neil Taylor, he was an old guy. He had 21 years on a job. He was 42 years old, right? My first night, I'm 25 years old. I think he's old. So he says, what the hell are you doing? And I turn around, I said, I'm putting my face piece, and he goes, smack, get that thing off your face. Off my face. I put my helmet on. We go down the hallway. I'm crying. The snots are on. I'm choking. I'm coughing. I go down. I put the fire out. And he says, let me tell you something, kid. When you need your air, you need your air. You're lucky if you got 10 or 12 minutes in that bottle. He says, you got to save your air. Anytime you don't need it, you don't use it. Learn to take a feed. Wow. Okay. So that was the beginning of my bad habits. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's all, down, it all downhill from there. Yeah, can you get away with that today? Can you imagine, <laughs> trying, to, imagine trying to do that today? Oh, Slap in the face. Hooked up in a minute. They still had cowardice in the book of rules when I got on the job. They took that out sometime later. But they actually had charges for being coward, being a coward. Nice. Yep. Uh, yep. Louis loves that, right? That's what the oh other guy said. Oh, please, please. 
<laughs> what were you hooked up for? Be a coward. <laughs> They'd have a whole line of charges on people, right? I never heard mm -hmm. of that either. Mm -hmm. Bro, so two things. Oh, I'm, I'm a, I got full of useless information. <laughs> Stuffing the rags in horses' asses and the six coward six drugs. Six yep. drugs. So my grandma, right. well, my grandma grew up in East New York, and uh, she actually used to hang around in front of 231 and 120. And she was telling me how when the bells would go off, all of a sudden the horses would start stamping their feet, the fire would be sliding the poles, they'd be running all over the place, and the horses would be stepping into the harnesses as they lower the harnesses down, and they're holding the horses back as they're putting on all the harnesses and everything. And then all of a sudden they'd let it go, everybody would jump on the steam, and they'd go running out, the, running out the door. She says that I had a rope across the front door, the, uh, across the apparatus mm -hmm. door. They drop the rope. When they drop the rope, all the kids would run. You know how um, 231's quarters is? You walk in, you can go straight up the stairs and right down the pole yeah. over there? Yeah. That's what they're doing. Up, down, back, up, down. That's what they do. They go round and round and round. The fire would come back and say, get out of here. And once they put the rope up, you didn't you didn't break that line. That was the, the plane that you didn't break. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. She you said never it was think about, You never think about what was involved in responding back those days with the horses, man. Oh, you know? my yeah. God. Yeah. Yeah. Well, she says you can hear the clapping of the horses going and the, the wheels on the, on, the, on the cobblestones. And she said it was just so exciting when they got there. Everybody was getting very excited because the horses are jumping, the men are jumping. If there's a dog, the dog is barking. Mm. Everybody's going at it. That's cool, yeah. man. It was a lot of fun. I'm sure it was a lot of fun in those days. Maybe back in the days with the horses, there's a salary. Just we wanted he wanted to share the salary with them back in the day there. <laughs> 1960, yeah, 60, 60, 60 my father got on 1960. So 60, 60, 700 dollars a year. Yeah, Holy right. Christ. That's crazy. I think Ruffy makes that uh, every hour, doesn't he? <laughs> <laughs> 15, 15, 15 <laughs> minutes. <laughs> uh, who who are the bosses over there, Cap? Okay, so um Richie Mills, Richie Mills. I'd like to give a shout out to Richie Mills. Richie Mills, nothing ever rattled that man's cage. One time we're playing baseball in a bunk room. I don't know why, but I'm probably, but that's what they said we're doing. So we're playing baseball in a bunk room. He throws the ball, whap, I hit the ball right through the window. Right? We all stop. The door opens up. Richie Mills sticks his head out, looks at, right, looks at that, looks at the guy who was a senior man that day. He says, make it look like nothing happened. Close the door, walk back inside. That was it. So, like, oh, I like that. Anyway, Richie Mills, cool, calm, always at a fire he was just a really good guy and he passed away when he passed away he passed away may 26th of this year i called his son jimmy mills medal winner I came on with jimmy Bummy, you came, I on, came with jimmy? on with jimmy yeah, yeah. Yeah. so i called jimmy off of my condolences i wish i'd have known that he passed away i would have drove back to new york for his funeral dynamite guy dynamite guy so he was um the captain they had uh roy levesque that's richie mills right there well which guy uh on the oh. right you can't tell who's the captain there. <laughs> no, we're in the bronze. Anyway, sitting on the couch, yeah. But did so he end up being a chief cap? He no, he never was a chief. He, he was um, a captain. He transferred from forty two engine after several years to uh, one sixty six truck in Staten Island. <clears throat> yeah, because his son was in one seventy six truck. Yeah, but there's a couple of his brothers, a couple of Richie Mills brothers, were on the job also, I believe. So uh, he was a lieutenant. You had uh, Artie Santangelo, who ended up in um, thirty eight truck. You had um, Roy Levesque, who spent his whole the rest of his career in 42 engine. Roy Levesque actually got thrown out of a bucket as a fireman, uh, working under the L somewhere in Harlem, I believe. Um, and then there was Tom Fahey. Tom Fahey, he was uh, Tom Fahey was a pit. He was just uh, he was a great, great guy. He had a lot of good sayings to him. You know, he was just a real good guy. As a matter of fact, Tom Fahey's son, Michael Fahey, was the uh, Tank chief killed up in the Bronx. Oh, that shit. Is that house, right? He came down and killed him. Yeah, yeah, that was uh, Tom Fahey's son. Tom Fahey's a dynamite guy. Wow. So those were my officers there. And as time went on, let's see, um, one of them left. John Malkin showed up. Bobby Morris showed up. Um, yeah, there's your boy. There's John Malkin. John oh, there's Malkin. John Malkin. Me right? too. Um, there's Gabby and Leonard and Yano. What's and that Jimmy. guy got on his head there? And foil? <laughs> <laughs> trying, to, <laughs> trying, to, trying to locate the spaceship. <laughs> oh well, okay, that was one of those nights they were making tinfoil helmets for. Uh, I don't know. Good, Good recovery, you. Mav. Yeah, <laughs> you know, <laughs> you a lot of silly things in those days. How, how does the kitchen table change? You think from when you got there, forty-two engine, to when you left in two thousand eight? Well, in two thousand eight, I have to say sensitivity wasn't a big thing yet you know in right. 2008 we were still still having um conversations saying words that you don't say today and, mm -hmm. and uh it, it wasn't it didn't change a lot it got a little bit softer but i think guys yeah. pride themselves on being sh quick quick-witted and sharp-tongued yeah. and 
you know, they, they, it's tough like that. You know, I like that is it. true, Cap. That is yeah. true. The faster you can get something out, and if the guys react, like if they laugh right away, like that, there, there definitely is something to that. There's no doubt about yeah. that. And you know, it's funny because in the volleys, when when they, you know in Long Island they have a bar with every firehouse, mm-hmm. so uh, we would be at the bar after drills, and we start breaking them, and people would say things, and it's just like boom, boom, I spit it right back at, them. and they're like, "How do you do that?" I says, "Many years of practice watching yeah. the watching the guys do that, and that teaches me how to do it too." Well, I'm gonna get a picture. Ruffy knows this because we we grew up together. But when I was growing up, I had a gigantic kitchen table because there was nine of us. And my father was a fireman, my brothers were firemen. And I I know who actually has that table roof for my kitchen back then. I'm gonna get a picture of the original kitchen table because that's where I was a kid, I six, seven years old. My father's breaking our balls, my brothers are breaking our balls. I'm like, so when I got to the firehouse. And his mother's easy. a saint, for God's sake. It was and easy, she, peasy, bro. Like, I, you think you're going to bother me? I haven't heard worse from my old man or from my brothers. What are you kidding me? Yeah, really, really. Yeah. That's awesome. That's <laughs> awesome. So they, they did break horns a lot. That first night I was telling you about where I had all that work in 42 engine, that, um, that first night they did nothing but break horns. We ran around all night long. And it was, like I say, it was um, – it was probably fires that you that you kind of go into like this. You know, you kind of take, okay, come on, guys, let's stretch a line in here. They were probably fires like that, but six fires for a kid like me it was a lot. So I drove home the next morning thinking to myself, what the hell did I get into? I couldn't believe it. I fall face down in the bed. I go to sleep. I wake up. I go back to work. Cap says to me, um, good guy goes upstairs. Cap says, you had a good night. It seems like you got a grip on things a little bit. He says, um, it's my second night tour. He says, we're having a party here tonight. In those days, you used to have parties in the firehouse. He says, um, if, if anyway, we're having a party. I can't go to certain certain areas there. So uh, we're having a party, and I'm sitting in the kitchen, and it's about 2, 3 o'clock in the morning, and I'm sitting with my feet up on the table, and I'm leaning back, and I'm sitting there, and I'm thinking to myself, I'm going to like this job. And all of a sudden, I call my turn, I look, and here comes this guy across the table. Boom! He slides across the table. Plates are flying everywhere. It hits me. I go over. The other two guys come over and start kicking me. Don't you smile unless we tell you. You're a probe. You don't smile unless somebody lets you. You get permission to smile. I got to clean up this mess. And I get up and I look around. And I said, I'm going to like this job. <laughs> <laughs> he comes so sliding he across the table. <laughs> I mean, we had a fire in an old law tenement, right? You know how you got the, you walk up, you got an apartment on the left, apartment on the straight ahead, apartment over here, and apartment over here. And there's two, two apartments on fire, and I'm standing there, and my eyes are this big, and I got the line, I'm trying to keep the fire in there, and my backup man is standing on my hose line. You're doing good, kid. There'll be more line up here soon. <laughs> <laughs> I know. I know. That was the Falcon, Eddie McCann. They called him the Falcon. The Falcon. Yeah, but yeah. you know what? That Those, those are the guys, right? <laughs> Having those guys around you. Oh, that's funny. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, Lou. I just thought that was funny. So, Cap, that's my lieutenant. Oh yeah, yeah. Uh, <laughs> now so, you made me lose my. I'm sorry, I just thought that was too funny. Everybody's got perspective, right, Patty? <laughs> well, you know, I, I also want to tell you. Did I mention auxiliary firemen? No, we, we had auxiliary firemen. Did they talk about that, right? No. Okay, so auxiliary firemen. They had auxiliary firemen back in those days still, and they had the yellow helmets, and they used to ride on the apparatus. They were like the extra man. So you had right. six guys on the rig, and you, now you had a seventh man. And they'd help stretch lines. They'd help the show up a hookup. They'd maybe do the deck gun if we're using it. Well, I walk into the kitchen, my first tour, and this guy is riding me. I mean, he's riding me, riding me, riding me, and I'm just listening to what he says, you know? And as a matter of fact, the mouse goes by, and I don't do nothing. He says, why didn't you step on a mouse? He says, the mouse has seniority. So... <laughs> Before me. <laughs> After like four tours, five tours, something like that, somebody says, why are you taking that shit from him? I said, he's one of the senior guys. Said, he's not even a fireman. He's an auxiliary guy. Um, what's an auxiliary fireman? I had no idea what that even meant. Yeah, well, I, I, didn't realize he had no I still don't know what it means. <laughs> <laughs> so people were able to volunteer in New York City as auxiliary firemen, ride the rigs and stretch lines and help stretch, you know, do oh, shit. They just couldn't go in, right? They, they couldn't go well, in the fire building. They weren't supposed to go in. Right. Yeah, right. When you also knows you, what that's like a little bit, right? You didn't have a yellow helmet. You had a red hockey helmet, right? No. <laughs> on the short <laughs> bus. Wasn't that you on the short <laughs> bus with the red hockey helmet? Hey, hey, hey Cap, did you have the uh, <laughs> Did you have the green rig? Uh, that we did eventually get the green rig. We started with a red rig, you know, the red rig that had the um, – yeah, that was, that was our rig. And um, that's Gary Langdon who was back to us. I know that. I'm not sure who anyone else is. 
But um, that's first two with Jerome and Marcy Place. Yeah, we had the green rig for a while. <clears throat> we had the red rig when I first got there. The old, um, they wanted the CD rigs. You ever see those CD rigs? They look like the Max with the, they had no muffles on. They were really loud. <clears throat> and uh, those are the rigs that every once in a while, when they had a crowd on a corner, Schofield would just slow down a little bit. And when he get to the corner, he'd step on a gas real hard. Black him. Yeah. The whole crowd <laughs> black smoke. Yeah, there you go. That was the rig when I first got there. Oh, you a rapid water guy. Um, the rapid water had just stopped when I got there. Oh, you got the little sperm on the door there. I talk about that cloud. When, when, I, when I first got to 117, I had, we had the 95 footer, but it would go out and I would have, we'd have a spare, which was from the 80s, the Mac. Yeah. And, you know, you'd be hanging out the back and I would look down, you know, we'd stop at a light and I'd look down at the car next to me and I'd be like, roll up your window. And they'd be like, what? I'm like, roll up your window. And they're like, what? I'm like, ah, don't worry about it. Fuck <laughs> Yeah, yeah. I mean, you black couldn't, black. all you could see was teeth. You know what I mean? You couldn't see anything. I mean, you, you're dating incredible. yourself. You're dating yourself, Ruffy. Roll up the window. <laughs> yeah, right, right, right. Tell them. You mean this? Roll up your window. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it was it was incredible. Unless you saw it, right? Like now, yeah. you you know the brig backs up. You wouldn't even know that the brig is on. For God's sakes, with the right. And we were still riding the back step. The captain, you were just, just starting to ask you that. I'm just going to ask you. We were starting to stop riding the back step. But Richie Mills, what he would do is he would take the engine covers and the old Max, the engine covers opened up. They, uh, they from the middle, they came up like this, right? They came up like that. And then they had a wire that you'd hook them up and keep them open. So he'd make us open that and hook them up. And then we'd all get on the back step. So if the chief stopped him and said something, he says, Chief, I'm having engine problems. It's heating up too much. I don't want to keep the guys in there. I don't, I put them on safety. I'm putting them on the back step. Oh, okay, Richie, all right. So we would ride the back step, and there was nothing like what straddling the back step, riding like this, looking over the side, and just being able to see what you're coming into down there. Yeah. One time, um, Hank Bray was driving, I think it was, and we turn on to Anthony Avenue, and there's fire blowing out of three or four windows on the left-hand side, and there's double park cars all on the right-hand side. And Hank looks at the cap and says, what should I do? He says, only hit the double park cars. <laughs> boom, 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 boom. Get off the back step, climb over the cars, go stretch lines, go up there. We come out, all the double park cars are gone. They're all gone. Nobody said nothing. I, I've heard that before. The guys yeah. say, if, don't hit the park car. If you're going to hit anything, hit the double park yeah. car because said, they're kind of at fault. Car. You know what I mean? He just went down and was like, doom, 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 doom. <laughs> <laughs> Mirrors <laughs> going like this. Boink, so, boink, boink, boink. Oh, they were, there was, there was side view mirrors. When the, not everybody had a side view mirror on the, on the uh, passenger side in those days, but whatever it was, it was laying in the street now. Yeah, Coop knows Love about it. that. Garbage cans. What? Oh. <laughs> Boom. Boom. Garbage, <laughs> Boom. What the, what, what, I, I, somebody probably told us already, uh, Cap, why, why did they go to those yellow rigs? What was the purpose of that? Was it was that supposed to be more visibility. That's what they originally said. It's going to give more visibility and stuff, but, um, you know, it just wasn't, wasn't working out. It was downright ugly. Yeah. Another thing, you know, Roy Levesque, he, he always made a stretch a line. No matter where we went, stretch a line at the front door, stretch a line into the lobby, always stretch a line. There he is. There's Roy Levesque. And that's Joey Aquino on the left next to him. Uh, Joe Aquino actually fell down a fifth from the fifth floor. He fell into a vacant building elevator shaft. And he said, as he opened the door, pulling towards him, he started moving in. He realized he's opened the door, moving in. And as he's moving in, he's realizing, ah, you know, that that's, you go into an apartment. You yeah, don't yeah, go yeah. into an apartment like this. On the and, door toward uh, you. Yep. He went down. The only thing that saved his life is landed a pile of garbage. Shortened his career. I think he only ended up doing seven, eight years on the job and just couldn't take the pain. Wow. Wow. That's a long oh, way. To oh, take oh, it stories, bro. That is, and then live? Oh. Yeah, yeah, really. Really. He moved to Montana. Joe was a great guy. Oh, and um, Roy Levesque would make a strap every single run we went on us because there were times when there was four probes on the back there. Joe had about five years on the job, six years on the job when I got there, and all the rest of us had pumpkin shields. So you'd have a six-year driver, an officer, and all brand new guys on the back step. So he made a stretch, 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 stretch all the time, and that's what made us good at what we did is because we always did it. Right. As a matter of fact, we never drilled in those days. One time. Matter of fact, we didn't even do BI in those days. Battalion chief, we're in a five six battalion. Chief comes walking in. I'm all nine o'clock in the morning. Everybody's still sleeping. We didn't get home until, until the morning, early morning. But he comes in. He says, uh, "Where's your officer?" I said, I, I, "I can get him." He says, "Why aren't you on BI?" I said, "I don't know, chief." I called uh, lieutenant uh, teaching quarters, and he comes. I said, "Chief, my guys are out all night long. We didn't get back to five o'clock in the morning." He says, "Oh, okay, okay." He says, "Don't worry about it." He walks out of the building. I walked up to Levesque and I said, "What's BI?" And he starts. <laughs> He says, you haven't been on BI yet? I says, I don't even know what it means. 
So that was my first introduction. Oh, I know somebody else who doesn't know what it means. They <laughs> just go to Fives, and that's it, bro. Well, you know, you don't know, you know the know. first fucking thing about it. What? 25 what? years. What yeah. the <laughs> I was like an old time of Portland when you get more lieutenant. This is way, way before computers. In the BI card files, you had the pink cards, right? Hmm. The pink cards were the cards that were vacant, vacant lots now. They were no, no longer building state, but it had a description of the building on there. So if you needed to buy time, you pull a pink card, you do a whole six-story age inspection, right? And he says, you'll never get in trouble because nobody will ever get hurt in that building. And like, you can't, can't take a mark for a building that people will be going into. But if you take a mark for a vacant lot, nobody's going to sue you for sue the building owner. So it was one of those things to buy time sometimes. So if you could have been writing that down, what uh, vacant lot, uh, pink car, <laughs> fourteen carry to two, 14 carry to two. <laughs> you do four years in the engine, and then you go to ladder nineteen, ladder nineteen, one six seven in Washington Avenue. Yep. Was that the normal progression from forty two? Because uh, no, normally it's fifty six truck. It was going across the floor. Yeah, but now what happened is I had made a rescue um, earlier in that year. And it was it was Super Bowl Sunday, right? It was January '85, I guess. And I was driving with my wife down the street, and all of a sudden I see this column of smoke. I'm going to my brother's house for Super Bowl Sunday, and I see this big cloud of smoke. So I slow down, I look down the block. Here's this freaking house blazing, right? So I, I drive down the street. Um, I tell my wife to tell somebody on across the street to call 911, and I, I kick in the front door. And I start going, and as I'm going in, I drop my wallet. I turn around and give it to this guy who's standing behind me, a guy I went to high school with, Bob Cady. <clears throat> I'm realizing as I'm calling down the hallway later, later, I didn't realize it was Bob. I'm like, I just gave my wallet to a guy, right? But I went down, I searched all the bedrooms. I couldn't get to the left with a wallet. Mm -hmm. So I ran around the back. I kicked in the back door, and I came in that way. And now I'm on my belly. I'm wearing actually a nylon 42 engine jack jacket that I had to get a new one because it got all burn holes all over it. Nice. And I find this guy there, and I grab him, and I pull him out. He is toasted, this guy. He's toasted. And uh, I got him all over my hands. I got him all over my legs. I'm stepping on, you know, my feet. And he's, I take him, I put him out in the snow. And he sits up and he says, my car, my fucking car is burning. I said, dude, you, you're lucky you're alive here. You know, so the fire department comes. I get in my truck, my, my car, truck, and I drive away. Um, I was in Iceland, Texas. The chief actually calls me up and says, uh, you're a city fireman? I says, yes, I am. He says, uh, I don't know how he tracked me down, but somebody knew who I was, I guess. I said, he said, are you on medical leave or something? Why did you run away? I says, I did what I had to do, and I left. I was going to Super Bowl Sunday with my brother. I kind of washed up. You know, I went in the back of his rescue rig and washed up, got all the stuff off me, and that was that. So it was a pretty exciting thing to do be all by yourself. I mean, I was in a truck on my 30-day detail with 27 truck. Captain uh, Jimmy Sheppel was there who tore me up one day. I went into a project build, and I asked, I'll get back to that. So anyway, I put a paper to go to the truck. Um so I put all the surrounding trucks. Here's 42 engine. I put all for all the trucks around 42 engine because I didn't really know 56 because they weren't in quarters with us. Right? So I put it for 56, 27, 44, 19, um, and whatever other trucks are right in the area there. So I just put the paper in. And the reason I, I left so rapidly on the transfer was because the 2-6 battalion has somebody that they wanted to push out of there. And the 5-6 battalion... Has a guy transferring from the two six to the five six. Well, look, just switch these guys back and forth. No manpower issues. So they, they got rid of that guy, and I went into nineteen truck. And now I went and visited each one of the captains except Tony Alva, who was the captain of nineteen truck, because he was on medical leave. And it happened so fast. All of a sudden, I show up, and uh, he's like, "Who the fuck are you to put a paper in my house when I didn't come to see me?" I said, "Cap, I tried. You want medical leave? I don't give a shit." And he just he was like, "Put the thumb on me right out of the gate." So now I'm in this firehouse, and I'm thinking. I got along great in 42 engine. Now I'm moving in a place where everybody's going to fucking hate me because the captain don't like me. So the first thing I do in those days, you go, you go to the uh, kitchen in the morning, you're having your coffee and whatever, and uh, you grab a newspaper, you head up to the shitter, and you do your business, right? So I'm in the shitter, I open the, I'm like, it's dark in here. So I had a small construction business at the time. So I ran some wires and put some lights up there. I was doing a commercial. <coughs> commercial drive at the time. I'm sorry, guys. It's all right. And, um, and then I did something else, and I did something else. I was fixing all these little things that I saw were, that needed fixing. So we're coming back from Yankee Stadium. We used to get on the rig. Now, we would, we would the whole ladder would have all guys sitting on it, but hanging on the back step, hanging off the side, and we'd just, take, the truck would take you to 19, uh, Yankee Stadium. We'd all get off, and then we'd call afterwards. Well, on this particular night, the captain we all, was with us. We all went there, and I'm in the company about two months, I guess. And as we're walking, out, walking up 167th Street uh, from the subway, we took the subway home for some reason, he says, Trek, come back here. 
So he says, did you do this? And did you do that? Did you do this? And he'd seen me at a couple of fires. And, you know, we'd had several fires together already. He puts his arm around and says, I just want to let you know I'm going to keep you. And I was like, oh, thank God. You know, I thought this guy was going to toss me. I really did. It was horrible. And then he, he gives me a hard right turn. We go into what Roberto's. There was this collision shop right behind 1950. And that's where we'd go to fix other people's cars when things happened on the streets. And uh, we went in there and he, he, I forget what he was drinking, but man, he, he practically dragged me back to the firehouse that night. So I got yeah. okay with Tony Alva after two months. He was a really good captain. As a matter of fact, my badge number was 333, 444. His badge number was 333. Was Mil but did Milner go to a 19 truck? Mike Milner was a 19 truck alumni. Yes, he was. Mike uh, Milner used to run circus nights inside the firehouse. We used to have Hawaiian <laughs> nights inside the firehouse. We used to have a lot of parties. One Hawaiian night, I was dressed in a grass skirt, a naked allegedly. Skirt, allegedly. skirt. And uh, one of the senior men started to get frisky. And I said, oh, okay, time to put the uniform back on. <laughs> <laughs> it was Milner. <laughs> <clears throat> we had some good times down there. We did. That is Moranchik, the giant Russian. What well, he was he was tough, man. He was a tough old bird, man. Yelling at people all the time. I don't think he was ever happy. Best in peace, Dennis. But, I'll tell you uh, right now. Pardon me? I would pay I would pay a thousand dollars for that door right now. That front that, that yeah, door right, right Yeah, now. yep. I forget who painted that. I forget who painted that. <clears throat> I don't think it was Jim Meyer Jack. Jim Meyer Jack was a 19 truck also. Wow. Was yeah. he? I didn't he, know. That. He was uh he was at the uh it's when I went it. to uh Proby school. Oh, Proby school. Okay. Yeah. He was teaching like uh, you know I whatever guess. he was teaching there, yeah. uh, physical ed or something like he was yeah. teaching, you know, stretching. Yeah, the, and um, Jim Maya Jack, when he got detailed to the probe to uh, the fire academy on paydays, we still had paper checks. He would run from the fire academy up to 167th and Washington Avenue, get the his check, and run back for lunch. Yeah. That's what he did. Matter of fact, my first roof that I cut. Jim Meyer Jack was um, on the inside team, and I was up there on the roof, and I had this guy had me by the tail of my coat, just holding on to the tail of my coat, and I'm cutting the roof, and the fire's rolling over my head, and I'm cutting the roof, and I'm thinking to myself, I don't even know this guy. You know, this guy's coming by, the, by he's holding me by my tail on my coat tail. I don't even know this guy. I got combat boots and blue jeans on, you know, and uh, came mm -hmm. off the thing, and he says, so what, Tony, what do you think? Meyer Jack says, Tony, what do you think? I said, that was a great workout. He says, that's not a workout. He says, that's why you work out. That was his mentality. Always, yeah. always well, I could tell he was I still remember stuff that he said in Proby school, like when I worked when I trained. I still remember things that he did and how he stretched and you know what he talked about from yep. all the way back then, you know. It's pretty he funny. had a whole bunch of sayings that they had all over the walls, too, right? And even in the little so gym. Didn't, didn't they have a whole bunch of plaques with things that he said? Oh, the and, bricks in the wall. The, everybody's yeah. just a brick in the wall. Yeah, they had all the different bricks with everybody's names on it, and sayings, and drawings, and paintings. <laughs> That's so when they, they, uh, the corner mask was the gym. In the, in, on one block, they said if they had permits in the South Bronx, they would have burned it down. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. What, so, you, you ran with 44 up there, 44 truck, and who else? Yeah, well, 42 what? engine, I ran with 44 truck. When I was a 42 engine, I ran from the north down and right. from 19 truck from the south up. <clears throat> we were just south. East of 44. Yeah, somebody was telling me that the war years for up around 44 was actually a little later than the mid to late 70s. It was more like late 70s, early 80s, mid 80s for that That's area, right? right? That part, because it's the cancer was slowly moving up through the Bronx. That's right. why, look at look at what's busy now, all the way up to 39. Yeah, 37 truck and, 30 yeah. and, and 39. 30. 39 truck. Could you imagine? Yeah, we used to interchange up there. We still had interchange when I got on a job. If you did more than 20 runs before midnight, they would send you up to a slow house, and a slow house would come to your house. And uh, so we would interchange up there in the old um, night division, um, up 39 truck. Matter of fact, the thing we used to do is we used to take mugs home because these things are expendable. You know, you're always losing mugs and breaking things. So every place I worked, I would take a mug. So we had this captain after Tony Albert. We had this guy. Um, I won't even mention his name. Um, but he was, he was a deadbeat. And uh, so I, I'm I'm leaving 39 truck. And I got my cup and I says, "See you guys." And they're like, "Hey, that's our mug." And I said, "Thank you." <laughs> so they call the captain. The captain wants me to send the mug back to them. I said, "Okay." I says, uh, "I'll be right back." I went and I got a hammer. I says, "Give me a manila envelope. I'll send them back the grub." So he took the mug and he holds on to it. He says, "No, you can't send it back like that." I says, "They want it back." They didn't say how they wanted it back, but he actually drove it back up to this guy. No shit. Yep, yep. Mm. This guy. They said once to me when I came in, they said they were going to. 
I, I forget where the fire was, but they said, this guy stopped, took his mask off, put it on the ground, says, be careful up there, guys. I'm having mask problems. Now, we've been on the job. I've been using Scott for my whole life in the, in the fire department. I've never had a mask problem I couldn't fix on the spot because it was always my fault. I didn't press pot pressure coupling, purge valves open, the exhalator valve is not set, set, you know, things like that. How do you get a spot up there when you don't want to know part of fire? He, uh, he knew people. That's what happened with him. Well, I mean, why would he want to go there then if that's what he's not all about? I don't get he it. He couldn't figure it out. But that guy, Steve Lonigan, I was talking to you about, Steve Lonigan said it was really great because we all had the same mission, the same purpose. We all disliked the same guy. Yeah. So we all had the same purpose now. So one day for dinner, everybody's trying to work some, somehow get rid of this guy. So one day for lunch it was, I made steak, eggs, and potatoes, right? Yeah, steak, eggs, and potatoes. So you know those diet dishes, those long diet dishes like that, right? I put a steak on his plate that hangs over the side. I put a mound of potatoes over the top, and I fry four or five eggs and put it over the top of that. And I says, this is for you, Captain. And I put it in front of him. And the guy's looking at me like, oh. he, when he finally finishes up, I mean, he, he did everything but lick the plate, this guy. When he walks out, they're like, the hell, you're going to start kissing the captain's ass? I says, you guys are trying to get rid of him. I says, the best I can do is try and give him a heart attack. <laughs> <laughs> Poor guy. It's misunderstood. Well, anyway, he, he, he left and uh, um, McNally showed up, the chief of operations. Yeah. Wow. He showed up. Matter of fact, he, <laughs> we have an elevator once, and we did a lot of elevators. That's where I learned the trade. They, we did a lot of elevators. Matter of fact, they wouldn't even turn us out, call a 19 truck for an elevator to say, Otis, get out. So um, we're standing there waiting for an elevator to go up to get the suck elevator, and there's this guy. And, oh, there's other people in the hallway. It's a project building. He goes to get in. I grab him by the collar, and I pull him back, and I says, we need the elevator. Oh, well, I was here first, and I argue with the guy. I poke him with my hook. The door closes. McNally's just standing there. He turns around. He looks. Standing there. He turns around. He starts doing you need to work on your public relations a little bit. I said, Come on, man. When he was a client and we had the plan of firehouse, he says, you remember that? I said, I do. He says, you were right. He says, your public relations was just fine. <laughs> yeah. McNally was a great captain. And after McNally came Bill Seelig. Bill Seelig was another great captain. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Another, lieutenants, Comiskey and uh, uh, Longworth and uh, Jimmy, Jimmy, um, oh, I can't remember his name now. Jimmy Cavanaugh would take us, we'd come out of a building and he'd stay he'd standing in front of the building. He'd say, okay, stand right here. How many floors? Where's the fire escapes? How many windows here? Yeah, he'd just quiz you. So now when you're walking in for your size up, you're taking all this in and you want to make sure you know because when he come out, Jimmy's going to question you. And it really helps with your size up because he would make sure that you were taking all the points of your size up as you're going into the building. Hmm. He was good that way. They, they were all great guys. I learned from the best. I really did. I think I, Nike I, Truck was I, my I first. The fire. One of my first uh, details that I took from when I was in 117, I went up to 19 truck. Uh -huh. And I remember uh, knocking on the door and knocking on the door and knocking on the door. <laughs> <laughs> and finally, the chief came <laughs> to the door. He's like, hey, how you doing? I'm like, hey, you doing, chief? Uh, I'm the detail. He's like, yeah, everybody's downstairs. <laughs> yeah, yeah, well, that's good. That's I said, all right, I'm going to stay up here then. Uh, you know, Is that where you were looking to go, 19 truck? I always mess that up. No, 33 yeah. truck. Oh, 33 truck. Oh, you, okay. Yeah, yeah. And it's funny you should say that. Joe, you had Joe DiBernardo, Chief Joe DiBernardo on the show. Mm -hmm. oh, he told a story. Um, he loves this story. He still tells it when we get together. He comes up back from work. It's early morning hours, 3, 4 o'clock in the morning. And, you know, Chief pulls up to the door. Whoop, 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 whoop. I'm out like a light in the, bar, in the watch, right? So he comes in. He opens the door. He slams the door shut. He walks over, opens the garage door, walks over. And he's looking at me while the door's going up. He's watching me, right? He backs in. He starts slamming the car doors and everything. I'm, I'm snoring. I'm out like a light. He writes a note to me and says, if you were the enemy, you'd be dead and stuck it underneath my pillow. Chief D. Joe was a great chief, too. Really good man. Good man. Yeah. Chief, uh, the captain uh, it was, at the time it was Selig was, uh, was, he was the captain. Sock, right? He was, wasn't he? Uh, yeah, he was a chief of SOC. But yeah, he was in the 4-9 nine as well. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. that's right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Another, another good officer. So you spent nine years in 19, huh? That's a, that's yeah. a long time, man. Wow, I didn't know years. that. That's a long time, man. Yeah, that's what I, I spent the bulk of my career. In 1912. Uh, Tommy Correa and Rob, Rob Lennon, the one on the right, is now the battalion commander at 2-6 in that quarters. And Tom Correa, I believe, is the chief in charge of training right now. Wow. Mm-hmm. 
That's crazy, right? When you look at the young guys, and now all of a sudden, yeah, it's crazy. a lot of fun in that kitchen, man. Oh, this is great. You got you got three characters here. Okay, on the left is Steve Carbone, who's a union guy. Yeah, um, Joe Rio, a legend, and on the right is George Gabriel, another lunatic. So now this guy in the middle, George Joe Rio. Joe Rio, there's stories about Joe Rio once on a three-story frame that was collapsing and he had the roof. He rode the roof down like a surfboard and just did like two tumble salts and stood up and he was falling. <laughs> the stories they tell about him, yeah. And now Teddy Beshman tells a story about he was in a in a um in a building and he's going down hall with a line and things start to go bad and guys are like, bail out, bail out, bail out. And Teddy can't bail out. And he yells, I, I can't get out, I can't get out. And Joe Rio yells down. Hold on to the bell. And Joe Rio, hand by like this, Paul drags Teddy. No shit. Teddy told me the story. Drags Teddy Bushman down the hallway and pulls him out of the building. Wow. And that's, that's just two of many, many stories. Joe Rio's face looked like he was a goalie for a knife throwing team. You know? <laughs> <laughs> Put the picture back up, John. I got to look at that guy again. You can't see it from here. Now he's no, been- no, I'm just saying, how old do you think he was there? I mean, he's an older guy, yeah. Oh, yeah, I think he, him and Joe Sully, the other senior guy there, I think they got on a job in 1895. <laughs> <laughs> they were old times, yeah. Matter of fact, Joe Rio, when I first got there, now I used to cook all the time in 42 Engine, and now I get to 19 Truck, and I'm on uh, right in the middle between Joe Sully and Joe Rio, and they cook all the time. And I come into the kitchen, and everybody's, I, for some reason, I never really was in the TV room. I didn't like the TV room. But just not for me. I'm not a TV guy. I come walking through the kitchen. And I open it up, and there's rice in there. So I take the spoon, and I stir the rice, right? I put it down, and there's a long table, 19 truck, and there's a round table off to the side. I go to the round table, I pick up the newspaper, I'm reading it. Joe Wheel comes walking in, picks it up, and sco- turns around and screams at me, Who stirred the fucking rice? <laughs> I look at him, I stir the rice, Joe. You don't do that, I just banged this old lady, man. He said, oh, and me up like you couldn't believe. Peggy told me up, down, left, right. I said, Joe, I just stirred the rice. You don't stir the rice. Fast <laughs> 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 forward, the Joe's retiring now, right? And now everybody knew this. His recipe was rice and Rio. He added uh, gondolas and, and chickpeas and onion. And he, he made it a special way. His rice was awesome. It was really, really, really good. So he's retiring. And I walk up to him. I says, hey, Joe, now, you know, I probably have, I don't know, 10 years, 11 years on the job. Joe, I says, don't let the rice and real recipe die with you. I says, will you give me the rice and real recipe? He gives me stink guy and writes the whole recipe, right? And he keeps to this much of the page. And on the bottom of the page, this much, the other half of the page, do not stir the rice. He <laughs> <laughs> didn't forget. Yeah, that's <laughs> freaking awesome, man. Yeah. That, that's like a typical thing too with some old time, right? They they have their way and that's it, man. Oh, yeah. And then you know, all you're trying to do is help out, but he fucking lost his marbles. Yeah, looks like he's uh, counting some shekels on that table too. What is he doing? Yeah, it looks yeah. like he was trying yeah. to figure yeah. out the meal. Yeah, 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 yeah. Always an issue for some reason. Donald was always an issue. It was always a quarter short or a half a dollar short. The old time that meant something, a quarter or a half a dollar. Yeah. And the other old time with Joe Sully, I don't have any pictures of him, but I mean, I, didn't, I don't think I gave any pictures. He used to sit in the corner. He had a comb over from here all the way over, right? And when the wind would blow, his hair would do this, right? Float up in the air. And he would sit in the corner, he had a high voice. He'd talk like this, right? He'd sit there with his little diner coffee cup, and he'd be drinking. And now Jim Jack was coming back to the firehouse, and they were all talking about Jim's going to make us eat healthy. We're not going to be able to hamburgers and steaks and everything. And Joe Sully sitting in the corner, classic Joe Sully. He turns around and says, hey, if you're worried about your health, you're in the wrong job. Go become an accountant. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, it's a if you're worried about your health you're in the wrong job he's not Probably. lying but yeah. somewhat. he ain't lying that's for sure yep, yep, yep. oh my god that's so freaking funny my face, my face is killing me right now do we have any more pictures from 19 uh, I have before we move that. on yeah, well I have one that might change the subject a little bit but we have that one well, my boy Tristan he um he, he just loved the fire department from a young age. And there's pictures of him in uniform and turnout gear. And he, I used to take, I started taking him to work with me when he was like maybe six or seven years old. And the stuff that happened, one time Dwayne Marcy had his kids, Brian and Evan, with us. There you go. There he is, probably about seven, six. No, he's young there, but he's not old enough to go to work yet. So Dwayne Marcy brought his voice. There you go. There he is. <laughs> he loved my fire gear. So, uh, all right, now he's uh, now he's bigger than me. He's 14 years old, and he's got my gear on. So, um, Wayne Marcy brings his two sons, Evan and um, Brian and Evan, to work. And so the three of them are palling around. We get this job in the six-story H. 
That's a great picture. That's actually not my son, but I had to put that picture in because it reminded me of taking Send me that picture. I'm posting that up tomorrow. This guy? Okay. Yeah, send me that when picture. I, uh, I, I had the fire knocked down. I take him into the buildings, you know, like, all over the place. So, 44 truck pulls up first. 19 truck pulls up second. We're, we're back like this, back to back, uh, front to back. And they're sitting on a bumper with 19 truck. 19 throws the aerial up to the sixth floor window, and it's short by about four feet. And this guy is on the end of the aerial, and he's like, jump, lady, jump. She's like, you jump. I'm not jumping. And she's back, back in the building. Well, she ends up jumping anyway, not even by the aerial ladder, and she splatters between 44 truck and 19 truck. And he, her and he looks over and he goes, get those fucking kids out of here. You know, these are some of the things that they saw up there, which they were probably too young to see, but mm -hmm. he wanted to come to the firehouse. And other guys brought their kids to the firehouse all the time. He was, when, when I was in, um, when I got, I was in 283 engine, I come out of the building. Now he's probably about nine, 10 years old. And uh, I come, I respond to a fire on, Eastern Parkway, and it's two o'clock in the afternoon, and this whole section of stores, which is probably about 45, 55 feet long, just rolling out the windows. It was a calling store. Fires, I had to pull my toe up, my collar up like this to get underneath the fight to get into the going. I go in, we fight the firefighter was out, I come outside. And this, <coughs> sorry. There's Tristan outside. He's got gloves on and come up to here on him, and he's filthy. I'm like, what did you do? Oh, God, I was helping this one. Special line. That was just a line. I'm like, Tristan, come on. And um, uh, John Flynn, he used to call him Buckethead. You know, if he if he leaned forward, he'd start going like that. He had a head on like this. So he says, no, Cat, really. He, uh, Lieutenant, really, he says he was doing this. He, he, he'd break the line, and he'd run over and say, this is 234. He'd break the line, he'd run over. This is uh, uh, 323. And he'd break, break this. He was running around, helping him stretch lines, take, chasing kinks. He just loved it. Charlie Williams walked in for my relief once, and he says, are you using this computer? And it was a computer off to the side. It was a thing for making command decisions, things like that. I says, I wasn't using that. He says, well, who's running a second alarm fire? I says, that would be my kid. He says, that your kid's running a second alarm fire? You know, he just <laughs> knew his stuff. Yeah. He was good. What is that guy? Um, tell the captain his son is doing a term job in Baltimore. Baltimore. He's doing a term job in Baltimore? Yeah, I don't know what that means. I don't know. Maybe he's doing a terminal job. I have mm -hmm. no idea what that means. Term, he's been working at the fire academy he's, um, with the recent line of duty debts and the previous line of duty debts. That'll be two years next January. They um, they developed a, uh, a firefighter survival program over there. They have bailout systems now that they didn't have for many, many years. Uh, matter of fact, he was invited by Mickey Tomboy and um, Dow Couch to come up to New York with a team of his to go through the firefighter survival program that we developed in the uh, that was developed in the Special Operations Command. And uh, they went up there and they went through the grueling ruling uh, um, course that it is. And they went back to Baltimore and developed their own course relating it to the line of duty debts. That they yeah, had. yeah, yeah, yeah. Like we had yeah. the Scofani, right? We had the Scofani fire we did. We had uh, uh, the, who was the guy? I can't remember names anymore. Fowler? Um, was it Fowler fire? The Fowler fire and the one in the Bronx where with the Proby. And, oh, that uh, was um, not Brick. Not Brick. Brick was no. The one where they fell through the uh yeah with the what at the 99 cent store. Yeah. I can never remember the name. Oh, oh Riley and Car Pluck. Car Pluck. Yeah. Yes. Right, right. We we used to practice that fire too with the with the firefighter removal. You know, again, yeah. that's all our all our jobs that we, you know, you know, re you know, redid to practice it, you know what I mean? Whatever. Yeah, we responded to that one from Brooklyn. And um we were going up the Grand Central Park where Wayne Pyatt was driving. And he was driving so much. I'm sitting in. I'm, I'm sitting in the rig now. I trust my chauffeurs completely. I never say nothing to him. But I, I you trust him. Wayne? Oh, was he I, looking I, that way, or are you looking this way? Which way is he looking? <laughs> <laughs> you know, he, 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 he has a water field of vision. Yeah, yeah. He had 180 degrees, right? Yeah. <laughs> so That's he's flying. I, I find myself going, mm, mm, and I, I tell him, I says, "Let me know when we get to the Bronx." He's like, oh, "I'm in the seat." And I start looking out at the bay. He says, "What are you doing?" I says, "Like this can't look no more." I says, "Tell me when we get to the Bronx. I'll get you to the 99 cent store." We get there. We uh, they designate us to start setting up air carts. We set up air carts. We start passing down air and everything. And here comes Howie out. And I look at him like Howie. I know Howie since he's 16 years old. He was an East Asian fireman, and I was a Brentwood oh, fan. We do the racing team together all the time. I was stunned to see that. Stunned. Those guys did a hell of a job. Let me tell you, they took a beat, a real beat. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yep. 
I work right. with, uh, with Wayne. He was in the engine. He was a 263 when I was a 117. Well, that's right. He got appointed to 263. Yeah. I took Wayne in to ride with me when uh, when I was a, in 42 engine. And that was it, man. He says, I got to get a job like this. I got to get this job. Man, yeah. he was he was good. I, I had good times with him. Well, Wayne's a fun guy, man. Very trustworthy person. So why'd you want to go and ruin it? After you're 19, you go and study. You get promoted. You get promoted. Why do you study? This is why you study, right? The ah, scuttles. The scuttles. The scuttles. That's why. The so I get promoted from 19, and I end up – oh, let me back up for 19 one more thing. Um, we, we did a lot of good work there. And one night, Mike Buckeye and I had the outside team, and he still talks about it to this day. Uh, people run into me and says, oh, I ran into a Fenny. I so, uh, it's something about you guys cut three roofs in one night. Oh, that's Mike Buckeye. I know that. Because we uh, – that's what we did. We had uh, – a few jobs. We cut three roofs in one night. We, Mike was very impressed with that. And uh, I think he had to actually put down a pit bull that night that was burned. And then he just took his halogen and went and put down a pit bull. So anyway, so I ended All up in one night. Huh? All in one night. Yeah, yeah. That was uh, that was a good one. So I ended up in Manhattan as a lieutenant. Right. First, I go to first line supervisor training program. And Steve Lonigan, as I said, got promoted together with me. And I go to the first line supervisor's training program. And I was a runner back in those days. And uh, Steve and I were running for lunch. And I look at him one day and he says, We're not going back. He says, Going back where? He says, We're not going back to 19 truck. He says, I know. I says, I think I'm just getting this through my head now. We're not going back. You know, <laughs> you realize you're, out. you're out. You're out now. Yeah. I don't think you really understand that. Yeah, there's my son and my wife at the uh, promotion. Sorry, I was uh, I was trying to pull up the uh, the gentleman. You wow, were I don't even about. look like you. Holy mackerel. Let me go, hold on, let me go back to it then. So you can take, you can take that in. I'm old now. Wow, wow you were a young buck, huh? Uh, let's see. That would be in 94, so it might be 38. Wow. 50, yeah, 38. Oh, and you look, you look skinny, skinny from running. <laughs> yeah, that's my family. Looks like he's part of the oh, yeah. club. Yeah. Married up club? He yeah. definitely married yeah. up club too, bro. She's a good woman. She uh, she helped to save my life. She really did. In many ways. I was a, I was a little bit of a lunatic once upon a time. So uh, she helped to make me. She had an elegance about her that kept me kept me straight. Oh, straight. Fire. Have, you met, have you met Anna? A <laughs> hopeless <laughs> wife? <laughs> Talk about a lunatic? Yeah. <laughs> Somebody who saves a lunatic? Holy Christmas. Yes. Yeah. Good woman. Rosie's not doing too shabby either. Ah, uh, you're doing all right. No, it took me three times though to get it right, so there's a little bit of a difference there. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> you didn't learn the first time. No, nah. well, the second time. <laughs> nope. Negative. So you're in Manhattan. That's got to be like a fish out of water. Yeah, so I end up in the first division, right? <clears throat> I go in there and I report in. I go up to headquarters. Dave Corcoran is the division commander, and Terry Roach is the sixth battalion commander. <clears throat> so I come walking in, I walk in, I snap to attention. I said, General Lieutenant for Carrico, reporting as ordered, sir. Corkman looks at me and goes, Where do you come from? I said, I'm from 19 Truck. And he goes, Another fucking Bronx guy. And Terry wrote, <laughs> <laughs> yes. like that. Yeah. So um, I signed to the 6th Battalion and I'm bouncing around from, from South Street to 42nd Street, shore to shore. And I had a blast. I go to some, I go to your house, right? And you show me all the cool things in that neighborhood. And then I go to your house and you say, well, all the cool things. And then everybody showed me the best of their neighborhoods. And it was it was fun. It was just fun. It really was. But in one year, I had three jobs. So Jimmy McMahon from 29 Truck also gets promoted with me. <clears throat> and we go through folks, uh, flips together. And he actually lives in Mount Sinai. So we're commuting back and forth. We become fast friends. And he, um, he goes to Brooklyn. And he calls me up every night. Yeah, I caught two jobs at 227. Yeah, I had a job with the uh, 236. And he's just telling me job after job. And I'm sitting there like, I, I don't even pick up the radio. I, all I do is give it 1084, and then I, I, I'm done. So uh, I didn't, well, I shouldn't say that. I had a second alarm on a 40-story setback for an air conditioning unit. And I thought to myself, what the fuck? <laughs> they, uh, had a fire. There was double doors open, and it was a sub cell. I had to go down two stories. Oh, 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 There's just a little bit of smoke coming out of here, right? So I'm like, hold off on a it's 1075. A whisper. This is the Bronx mentality. You know, hold off on a 1075. I go downstairs, and I find it's a battery room burning, but the chief already got on a handy talk again at 1075. And when I come out, he says, uh, he says, where are you from? I says, I'm from the Bronx. He says, you're not in the Bronx no more. When you see smoke, you give a 1075, because it can take forever. Believe me. And you guys have been in Manhattan. It takes forever for people to get there. He says, get them coming. If we don't need them, we send them home. Got it. So it was a job. We stretched the line, went inside. I get back to three truck, and I pull out 20. I throw it on the table. I says, my first job with you guys. I guess I owe you a square bag, huh? 
And uh, Cat, the chief looks at me, same chief looks at me, he goes, he goes, we don't do that here. He gets up and runs out of the door. As soon as that door shuts, it's like, we do that here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Allegedly. So, uh, that's a really good time in, in, um, in um, Manhattan. But now as you bounce around, you figure out where you want to be. I picked three truck companies. I want to be in three truck, 11 truck, or nine truck. Those are my three choices. <clears throat> I talked to the captain of three truck. Of uh, 11 truck, he didn't have any openers going. The Captain 9 truck, I was in there for five minutes and said, I don't want to work for this guy. And so 3 truck was my target, and Mur Murphy was the chief there. Um, and he said, you're in. You're in. So I, I'm, I get the game of shirts, they gave me hats and everything, and I'm in. And a week before the order comes down, he says, listen, sometimes things change. I'm like, no, no, I'm in. You told me I'm in. I'm in. <laughs> <laughs> you said I'm in. It comes out that Ronnie Brown is the chief of division of training at the time, and his son put in for it. So Tony's out, Ronnie's kid is in, and I go up to Dave Cork and I says, can I, can I put a paper in to go to Brooklyn? He says, well, who do you know? I tell him who I know. He's like, oh, yeah, I know Fat Jack. And he starts talking. We're talking about this and that. And um, he says, well, if you really want to put a paper in, you can. I says, well, when can I do that, Chief? He says, whenever you're ready. I go, there you go, Chief. <laughs> right? Made a phone call two weeks later at the 4-4. Nice. Yeah. And then two weeks later, that happened. <laughs> well, no, that was when I was filling 42 engines. So you see the fire. Oh. We're advancing on that top floor, and we ran out of line. So Tom Fahey's on a, the lieutenant, and he tells Bobby Meadows, go downstairs, get a length of hose and another nozzle. So Bobby takes off downstairs, and maybe within 30 seconds to a minute, he says, you know what trick? He says, go to the window and tell Meadows to bring two lengths of hose up. So I go to the window, and I'm looking out the window, waiting for Bobby to come out of the building, and all of a sudden I hear you know, screeching of metal, and I look over, and I see this thing crawling in slow motion, just going down the side like this. Boom! <laughs> And it missed the building by this much. The bucket missed the building by that much. And um, a couple of broken bones, but everybody, John Crowley was in 44 truck, transferred to 19 truck. He was in that bucket that night. And uh, it was it was mortifying to see that. I was like, holy shit, I couldn't believe these guys were falling over. It's not supposed to happen. Yeah. Th those guys ended up being all right, though, correct? Or... They did. Yeah, I think it was a broken arm, a broken leg, and one guy wasn't injured at all. Don't hold me to it, but I'm pretty sure that's the way it was. Yeah, I don't remember it ever being... Uh... So you get to the four four. So uh, how long did that take to go to the fire? It's not too long, I would imagine. Well, uh, well I'm signed to the four four. Tommy Gavin's my uh, Galvin is my um, evaluator. So I go to the division headquarters and I meet the guys down there, officer assignment and everything, and I tell them my plan. You know, like the old saying, "If you want to make God laugh, tell me plan." Well, these guys laughed when I told them my plan. And the first place they sent me is three twenty three, right? So I say, I say, okay, this is just a test. That's all it is. Go to 323. It's all right. You know, yeah, it's a good spot. Nice little spot. Yeah. yeah, but it was it was very, very, very slow back then. Yeah, yeah, you know? yeah. I went from slow Manhattan to slow Brooklyn. But I knew it was just a test. So I finished up my vacation there, and they gave me um, a, a night tour in 255. Jump up to 255. First run, get a job in one of those PDs over on like Avenue H or something like that. Next to your oh, old house. I mean, <laughs> next to your there. old house. <laughs> 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 so um, I go in the front door and there's bicycles and everything. I say, hold the line right there. And I just start going to bicycles and the baby carriages and everything out. We go, we had like two rooms, something like that. We go in and knock it down and we go back to quarters and they're hooting and howling and carrying on. I'm like, I like this place. Man, this is a good house. Then I bounce around the division for a while and I start to zero in on 175, 157, and 123. Those are the three companies I'm looking for. Um, meanwhile, somewhere along the line, Tommy Richardson had a guy go on long-term medical leave, so he asked me if I'd come UFO to his house for a couple of months. I did that. He was a captain of 234, as you know. Um, then uh, Tom, um, Charlie McGrath calls me up, and he says, uh, I got a – oh, where's Brian Fink? Maybe Brian called me up and, and uh, told me that Charlie McGrath wants to have me UFO. And guy, Dennis, Dennis Driscoll, you, you know those chairs that you have the metal frame and you have the wooden seat on it? Well, he goes in a restaurant. He goes like this to scoot his chair in. And as he does that, the chair comes up, his pinky finger gets in it, and poof, takes off the top of his pinky. Right? Mm -hmm. So he's on medical leave for a while. So mm -hmm. I do two months maybe in the house. And my philosophy as a lieutenant was when you come to work, you got nothing to do. I took care of everything. I took care of all your paperwork, all your roll calls, all your time and payroll. Everything's done. When you come to work, you got the night is off. You hang out with the men. You do your job, job stuff. And the next morning, you can actually start to work again. And McGrath liked that style. So he said to me, he says, when I get an opportunity, I'm going to bring you back here. I said, I'd love to be here. So fast forward, the opportunity comes. He calls me if I want to come to UFO. He says, oh, yeah, I go to 157 in a heartbeat. I'm not there two weeks, and Tommy Galvin calls me. He says, hey, I know you look for 175. There's a UFO spot there. I'm like, chief, 
I just made my commitment to Charlie McGrath. I can't leave. He says, 175 is a really good house, but my name would be mud if I turned around and left 157. I really like it there anyway. So he let me go, and uh, I stayed, and the rest is history. I got assigned, and I was so hot when I got there, as a matter of fact. I was going fire at the fire, doing two, three fires at 24. That Juan Fuchs called. No, I didn't know Juan Fuchs at the time. Juan Fuchs calls me up. So, is it Brooklyn, 120? Juan Fuchs. Did you have him on the show? Yes. Yeah. Yeah, awesome guy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Awesome guy. Calls me and says, uh, Lieutenant for Carico. He says, this is Warren Fuchs. This match is 120. I says, uh, yeah, what can I do for you, sir? He says, when are you working again? I says, I'm working Wednesday night and Thursday. He says, okay, I'm going to come ride with you. Click. What, what happened there? How can he's telling me he's going to ride with me? But I didn't know he was a friend of the firehouse. And he was right. out there. These guys knew Warren. He was part of the firehouse. That's what he yeah, was. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, because I was so hot, everybody wanted to work with Mike Bruce for a while. That went off for I'd say two, three months easily. And then it leveled out, you know, because uh, it just, I was just so hot. It was smoking, man. I was going everywhere. You know, you know what I wanted to ask you? Coming from the Bronx, going to 255. Now, I've worked there a lot, right? Uh, so <clears throat> how, how did you get past the, uh, you know, that, I mean, that place is, if not the place, it's, uh, it's, it's up there with 290, is probably the oh, fastest yeah. turnout as, as, as there is on the job. Yes. And uh, Banzai was my chauffeur. Billy Runow was my chauffeur. Danny Dempsey was my chauffeur. Uh, Dennis, Dennis Heaney was my chauffeur. And those guys, they were they were all good, good chauffeurs. But I, I just said, do not fucking read me. <laughs> <laughs> I might have said those words before myself. No, no, don't. I mean, me. how fast? I mean, literally, there is no, there is no. You're eating. You have your fork like this. <laughs> and the, the B part. Beep, the B part. And the forks are in the air. They're in the air. And I'm not kidding. It's not. <laughs> they are running to the rig. You know, and that's a tight kitchen. You know, like to get yeah. around. It, it, you know, guys cut yeah. through the uh, the TV you room. Get trampled on in that little hallway going between the kitchen and the apparatus floor. If yeah, you yeah, know it's in front of quarters there. If you did you notice in the roadway, there's tire marks going this way in the street, there's tire marks going that way in the street because they come out and they're leaving rubber in the, on, the, on the pavement as they're coming around the turn. Oh, yeah, there's it's it's full out. Oh, yeah, there's, they're fast. It's out. Full out, Matter man. of fact, they tried to get Charlie Price to go faster. So, what they did is they took a donut on a stick and taped it to the roof so the donut was here. Who <laughs> 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 was the guy? Fish? Who was the guy? Fish? Oh, was there. fish, fish, fish. Fish was the man to go to when I needed something done, right? All I had to do was say, Fish, can we get this done today? Don't worry about it, boss. I got it. And he would make sure things. And he I was remember uh, a lot of those guys. Good senior man. Good yeah, senior Schweiger, man. Like Billy Ryan was there, right, at the time? Was Billy Ryan Billy there? Billy Ryan was not there when I was there. He was oh, he there. wasn't there? He already went to three, I believe. Oh, he had already left. Yeah, yeah. Mm. Fish, actually, we were coming down, uh, we were coming down um, I think it was Rogers Avenue, and at Linden Boulevard, Fish, Fish was a cautious driver. Matter of fact, I used to complain to him. He's like driving with Stacey, you know, especially compared to the other guys. You know, listen, Banzai don't get a name like Banzai for nothing, right? So um, Fish is driving down, and he was a cautious driver. As he starts to go into Linden Boulevard, <clears throat> this car must have been doing 80 miles an hour down Linden Boulevard. He hits the front of the rig, bounces off. The glass shatters, comes flying into the apparatus. The car rolls across, bangs into the, into the uh, building across the street. You know how they have those long setbacks, deeper setbacks on Linden Boulevard? And it's like, holy shit. So I call in a, a major accident, and everybody starts to show up. And uh, I forget who the chief was. The deputy chief shows up, and he says, uh, no, he made a major accident also. And then the aide calls back, went to the hospital, calls back, and says, listen, this lady's denying, uh, doesn't want to be treated, and she's leaving. He says, well, that makes it a minor. Everybody go home. <laughs> yeah. that, was a, that was a lot of times, right? In those areas, like even by 290, that, that, that would happen a lot. You get into an accident and the people wouldn't want to, either they had no insurance or. Well, you know. most, of the, most of my time in the job was that way. Yeah. You know, that's why we had Roberto behind 19 truck because if somebody wanted something, it's like, okay, hey, go, go to Roberto. Yeah, yeah go, go get the car fixed, whatever, right? Yeah. Allegedly. That's just the way it was. <laughs> I used to, yeah, I used to yeah. go down um, to uh, to fleet maintenance, and I go as a boss, both in the uh, engine and uh, in uh, 157 and in squad 252. I would go down there and talk with um, Andy and get spare parts, and I keep them in a locker downstairs because you know there's things that are expendable, like like side view mirrors, they they break, or they just break. So marker lights, you know, things like that. Keep mm. them in the locker, and this way you just replace it. Did you ever have a fire near your old house? 
Um, I've had fires around that neighborhood. Not yeah, in yeah. my house. I actually did have a run of my grandmother's, not only her building, but her apartment. Oh, my gosh. Yeah. 4G, 120 Kenilworth Place, 4G. I walked in and I looked around. And I said, wow, because I was a little kid. I yeah. looked so small. You know, I thought grandma had some big apartment. It was yeah, so yeah, small. yeah, right, right, yeah. right, right. I mean, that area, when you're working in the truck there, like, again, it's such a huge response area for the truck there, right? I mean, you're in, yes. you go to 147, you go south, you're in like real, like, uh, it's a nice area, right? If you go south, is that the Jewish yeah, area? South, you get into Marine Park down yeah, there. Yeah, it's like, yeah. It's nice. And you go over to Marine Park Bridge, you got this Ponset. And, uh, yeah, yeah, big houses and stuff. Yeah, it's I really mean, nice. It's there. incredible how big that area is. When One of my first ones, as I was covering there the first time, I'm covering it. We're driving and we're going. And now, I've been in the Bronx, which the companies are closed. I've been in Manhattan. The companies are closed. I'm going. I was like, where are we going? Where's this box? He says, "Oh no, we got a ways to go." I says, "How big is this area?" I had to actually look up how big this area was. One of the bigger areas that they had. Oh, it's huge. It developed so much later in time, in uh, in the career, the history of the job. Oh, don't forget saddle up. Saddle up. We got a shirt. Saddle up, baby. Sounds like right? work. Have you heard about saddle up? Yeah, we have. We have a shirt. Saddle up. Oh, okay. Sounds like work. Now we know we, we had to send them rough. Now we Warren, know what's going Warren was the one who started that. Warren started that. <laughs> yes, if, correct. The cops would come in and he'd know it was going to be 157 was either going to be first or second do or even third do, right? All you'd hear is, ooh, saddle up. And poof, like Louis said, poof, and go. I love they wait for the tones. <laughs> yeah, they got the little uh, hint, hint. 10 to 12 or 14 seconds before the tones came in when saddle up came. Matter of fact, yeah, the 150th yeah. anniversary, if you look at 157 in the book, in the 150th anniversary book, they have the garage door lifted up enough where it has a spray paint saddled up across the back. Nice. Yeah. Oh, yeah, they were good, man. 157 was a good shop. I had a lot of good work there. We had a great time. You spent a decent amount of time there, six years, huh? Yeah, yeah. That's a lot yeah, of fires. Yeah. Those are war years, too, babe. Uh, uh, dog years, you know? Oh, well, we had some real good fires. Real good a lot fires. of running. I remember this one fire. Now, as, as you know, as a boss, when you're on the radio, you, you, you don't want to be a screamer, right? And so uh, we're, we're on, I, don't, I forget where it was, 37th Street and H or K. Anyhow, we as we come up, I can see the four or five buildings down. I can see a fire on the second floor of a two-story multiple dwelling. So I pick up the horn, 157 book in 1075, fire on the second floor, two-story two -story dwelling, um, blah, 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 right? And... Um, when we got back, the guys in the end were like, you got to put a little oomph in that. We hardly heard you. I says, what, you want me to scream? I says, you scream, you yell at me. I talk short, you're going to yell at me. I says, it doesn't make a difference. I'd rather remain calm. But this thing was cranking. And it was, I remember it was Davino, Chauncey, and myself in there. And we were by ourselves. We went in as far as we could, did the searches, you know, waited for the engine. But that's, that's what I liked about these. They were very aggressive. Matter of fact, at one point, we were someplace. I forget, we relocated. We were someplace. And we had a second do fire. And as I'm going by, I hit the boss and Shaw. says, 157, we'll be above. And um, when we come back, they said, you don't do that down here. I said, what are you talking about? I wasn't used to that. Where I worked, this is where we worked. So, you know, you got to learn things depending on when in Rome. Doing. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Well, it's not so much don't do that around here. It's just that there's, there's strong companies, there's weak companies. We happen to be in a neighborhood that there was weaker companies. And that's why they said I shouldn't do that. But I've never worked in weak company with weak companies before. Mm. There was always good, strong companies. Did oh, they have yeah. the toilet bowl in the ceiling at that time? Pardon me? Did they have the toilet bowl in the ceiling? Do you remember that? Like, no, I didn't see the toilet bowl in the ceiling. No. <laughs> no. But we did have some fun over there. At Christmas time, we'd, uh, after Christmas, we'd take the Christmas tree and put it in a bucket of diesel fuel and leave it out there until, um, what do they call it, February 1, 2, 3 or something like that? Where there's, uh, there's a word for it, I forget. But uh, then we'd have a ceremony. On that, <laughs> yeah. we had flashovers. That was interesting. That was very interesting. <laughs> I I think I told a story one time. I I was covering there, and they they had a boys' night out. You know, everybody was going out, and I don't remember. We had we had a little bullshit job, and we came back, and uh, I went up in the office, and I was just getting back to sleep, <clears throat> and the guys came back. It was two, three, four in the morning, whatever it was. And it was rowdy, man. It was a lot of shit going on down there. And then it got really quiet, right? <laughs> and then all of a sudden, I heard this explosion, like, uh -huh. boom. Like, <laughs> I'm like, what the F is going on, right? So I get up to cover the, the guy in the engine. I don't remember who it was, but he wasn't, the, you know, he was covering for the for the tour, you know? 
we go downstairs and they had not not like a little can like of of uh beans like the big can you know like the fat can of pork and beans they put the can on the oven uh, on the stove <laughs> and just let it cook in the until it like blevied but it was <laughs> fucking beans all over the place i don't even know what the hell was going on i don't even remember what the hell was going on but yeah, sometimes they, they were, were uh, actually in 157 and the 252, two different guys. Uh, go after doing 252, they do the mac gas inside of a plastic bag and then tie it off with a piece of um, toilet paper and let it run down. And then they go over and light it. And as it burned up, they also would hit that. Boom! <laughs> <laughs> I never heard of that one either. Allegedly, but, uh, allegedly, yeah, it happened. Uh, could have happened. Gonzo, yeah. don't, don't, don't get nervous. Yeah. Chief. <laughs> You're not a safety chief, are you? Okay, good. He's, he's like, muted. you're muted. I'll tell you that. He's like, sorry, I'm, 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 I'm training. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I'm trying to be quiet. I don't want to interrupt, interrupt too much. <laughs> All right, so let's get to the captain. 157, we ran and ran. Matter of fact, when I first got there, um, I was doing some drills and, on some of the more obscure tools, and I was breaking them. And Charlie McGrath was like, you're breaking all my tools. I said, wouldn't you rather I break them drilling? And now I got you a brand new tool. So we, we would drill a lot. we do things like that. Matter of fact, this is a good one. You know, um, we're driving down the street, and like I say, um, if there's an ADV and I'm driving down the street, it's time for drill. So I'm driving down the street, and there's this Jaguar up on blocks, no plates. I go around, I check the whole thing out. Up on plates, no up on blocks, no plates. The registration and inspection stick is scratched off it. Everything's gone. I said, and one window's broken. I said, ADV, let's cut it up. And the guy's like, this is a Jaguar. I said, you ever cut a Jaguar before? And he goes, no. I said, me neither. Let's have at it. So we cut up, we start cutting up this Jaguar. Um, Bill, uh, Bobby Maines from the, two, uh, from the 401 comes by and takes one look at what's going, gets back in his car and drives away. And um, we cut up the Jaguar. No big deal. So a month or two, three pass. And um, Richie's, um, Richie's is working as a covering captain. He's doing overtime at 255. So obviously they tell him the story about what's going on. Well, Richie's kid works in a precinct down the road. So what they do is this guy is diabolical. He gets his kid to fax him. That fax machine's in my office too. So he's going in and out with the fax machines. And I'm not even thinking anything of it. He faxes him five uh, police department buck slips, right? And so then what he does is he gets mains and Terry Roach the, from the two six. No oh, shit. He's the deputy chief. A lot he's of effort here. A lot of effort. These guys conspire and make up this whole big story about Dr. Witherspoon, who lives in Kensington, left his car there because he needed to get the swim tires. And, 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 he, and I, so now I don't hear nothing. The fax machine starts going. There's five or six papers there. And I pick it up and I start slip, flipping through it. It goes from the patrolman's report to the captain's report to the inspector's report to the chief of department to the borough commander to the 15th division to the 4-1 uh, battalion. To me. you. <laughs> and I'm looking at this and I'm like, holy shit, I'm dead. I'm, and I'm trying to think, how am I going to get out of this? Because that, that's something I think about. How am I going to get I'm trying to think about how I'm going to get out of this. And they call for chow. And I'm like, beside myself, I'm shaking my head. I'm like, you know, and he made it good. He said, like, the fire engine 157 showed up and cut up this guy's car. Yeah, yeah, the fire the engine. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I'm sitting in the kitchen and I'm really not paying attention. But all of a sudden, I think it's uh, Jimmy Cavanaugh turns around and says, Hey, Lou, you're kind of quiet tonight. Everything okay? I says, yeah, just thinking. And as I turn my head, everybody's looking at me. They all go like this. <laughs> <laughs> and you knew something was up. They're like, you motherfuckers. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm thinking, well, maybe, maybe, just maybe. This is a ruse. I mean, this is pretty complicated. This is a really thought through ruse. That's, that's... I knew when we had a job. Sometime, uh, we didn't finish dinner, but we had a job. And I come out of the building and... Bobby Mains is there, and he starts talking about it, but he can't stop smiling. And I'm like, "You, you fucking guys did this!" I mean, he's like the whole thing up. I have never been so had in my life. I thought I was losing my job. I really did. I've never been so had. It was amazing. Really, that was professional. That's a professional. Oh, let me say, Jimmy Richie's did an awesome job on that one. He had me hook, line, and sinker. I mm. thought I was dead in the water. But you know, sometimes you, like when as a lieutenant, I was working in. Um, 120 truck. I'm working a 120 truck, and we're coming down Linden Boulevard. We come up to, uh, we're coming down Pennsylvania Avenue, coming up to Penn uh, Linden Boulevard. You know how you got the, the side lane, then you got the two lanes, then you got the turning lane, then you got the two lanes, then you got the median, then you got the turning lanes. You know, there's all these different. Well, Heaney's driving me, and we're driving in, and we're coming over, and I see his van kind of swerving over here, and I think he's going to take out all the people in a bus stop. It's snowing out, 
and he comes wide north. He hits the curb, comes all the way across all six lanes of traffic, boom, right into 120 and slides off to the side there, right? Heaney doesn't hesitate. Throws the brake on out of the rig and after the truck. I'm like, oh, okay. 120 to Brooklyn. Uh, take us off the box. We've had a minor accident. I'll get back to you on this, right? So I had to think about it a second. You know, 120 to Brooklyn, blah, blah, blah. By the time I do all that, he's coming back and me. Puts the sirens on. Starts going, what are you doing? He says, ah, oh, that fucking guy didn't have a registration, didn't have a license. I told him, get the fuck out of here before you arrest you. And he left. Okay. I pick up the horn. He says, 120 to Brooklyn. Cancel the accident. We're responding. Uh, 120, you're canceling the exercise. It's 10 4, 10 4. It didn't hit us. Just we're responding. I get back to court. Is um, the safety chief, the deputy chief, and uh, 4 4 are waiting for me, right? So, uh, and it's redheaded butler. He's the deputy chief. He they bring me upstairs and they say, How the fuck do you cancel an accident? How do you do that? I said, Well, let me explain this to you, chief. I said, We're coming along, and here comes this guy. So I see the van sliding, and he hits the curb and comes right along. He needs. Slams on the brakes, throws the maxi brake, and this guy veers away, and I thought he hit us. And then Heaney jumps out to see if the guy's okay. He jumps back to the rig, and he says, he's okay. Got on the rig. I says, he didn't hit us. No, he didn't hit us. I said, okay, let's go. I'll cancel the accident. And they're all standing there like this. <laughs> <laughs> he looks at me and says, that's your answer? I says, that's my answer, Chief. And I lean back in my seat like this, and he just stared at me. They're all like, they can't believe that I just come up with this. So I, I says, don't do that again. And they all leave. Right? That was it. That was the end of that. Cap, in that area, I, I learned very fast after the first one not to give that I was, quote, unquote, in an accident. Until, until it was time. It was, well, you know, unless even if I was responding, I'd just say we're going to be unable to respond. I wouldn't say that we were in an accident because, like you said, most of the time, the people want, you know, they had a crap car or it was just a little clip or something like that. And they wanted to get the hell out of there. They didn't have a license, or, whatever or it was. Warrant for their arrest. Yeah, something. they just wanted to get the hell yeah. out of there. Yeah. Exactly. I had never, I only had one previous accident. Maybe that was before Fisher's accident, but I didn't have hmm. any accidents. I mean, you know, we scraped cars, things like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Kind of, but no, I, I hadn't had any the, I wish I had that. That, that, that was the chief who told me that too, by the way. <laughs> Allegedly. <laughs> Don't get the best fix, man. Guys, you've been there before, right? Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, no doubt. Yeah. <clears throat> and talking about tips with um, guys who've been there before, going back to 42 Engine, that guy, Neil Taylor, who slapped the face piece off of me. I want to give you a story with Neil. Neil was one heck of a mentor. <clears throat> so I'm new on a job. I had a lot of vacant building work, but not so much occupied building work. I had had probably a couple of dozen fires under my belt before I had my first occupied building. So we got this occupied building. It's a row frame. There's at least three rooms going in the back, and he's chugging down the hallway at us. And I hit my wall. Boom. I hit my wall. I can't go any further. I says, Neil, I can't go, go down the hallway. He says, get down the hallway. Come on, you can do this. I says, I can't. I can't get any further. I'm burning. He says, you're not burning. I'll tell you when you're burning. Get down the hallway. And I look, and he's, just, he's on a knee. I'm on my belly. I'm like, I'm not burning. So I went down the hallway, put all three phones out, and I'm like, yeah, man, that's what I'm talking about. That's And it was just a, an enlightening moment for me. And what he did that day is I teach this all the time, too. This is as far as I've ever been, as much experience as I've ever had. So now what he did is he goes like this, and he pushes me like this and opens up my window of experience, and he gave me more experience. I'll never forget that as long as I live because it made me realize you can do more than you think you can. You're stronger than you mm -hmm. think you are. You just got to have the guts to do it. And that was the forming of the, the guts, the bravery, the courage that you need to be a fireman. That was the beginning of that because the vacant building work was easy. You know, it's open. It's just a lot of fire and a lot of smoke. Not the smoke is not so bad because that's how you can take a feed because all the windows are gone, right? He he really taught me a lot that day. That's a common thing that we hear a lot from the guys on the show is that you don't know how far you know how would you know how far you can go? You know what I mean? Until somebody shows you how far you can go, exactly. right? Exactly. Yes. Yes. You need the guys to lead you through these things. Right? That's what you, they need to do. That. That oh, all comes please. from asking. Like Passing huh? on the information, just passing on information, right? It's just, yeah, you know, every, per you know, tradition and, uh, you know, aggressiveness and all that stuff, you know, you have yeah. to pass it on. Yeah. Uh, and the yeah, fact yeah, that he's well. he's uh, standing right beside you, too. He's not, you know, three rooms <laughs> down the hallway telling you, go further, bro. You know, he's yeah, standing yeah. right next to you. Yeah. <laughs> the boss that yells for can to come sliding down the hallway. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. You want me to go further. You're fucking three rooms back yeah. over there, Jack. 
42 engine funny. taught me how to be an engine. The 19 truck taught me how to be a truck. They taught me my forcible engine, my engine, my my elevators, my my uh, mm. um, all all the stuff you need to know as a trucky. These guys taught me over and over and over again. And we were also doing a lot of work at the time. Up until the Red Caps came into the Bronx, the Bronx was very busy. It really was. But the one the Red Caps came in, those guys, boy, they set up their trailer. They put their red FDNY fire marshal hats on, and they just swept the neighborhood. And they would arrest a bunch of archers, I guess, because the fire duty went down. It was still there, but it wasn't like it was. Nah. Well, they did good. They did good because it was out of control between the uh, bullshit uh, insurance claims and the shitty landlords and the city. Yep. You know, being complacent and burning it down. A lot of good fires in 157. Matter of fact, um, Gonzo, uh, there's a picture of 157 with a bunch of us standing in front of a red building. Me and George Johnson, we were uh, we were actually trapped on the top floor. And he called me Uncle Tony for some reason. He says, Uncle Tony, what are we going to do? I says, the line's coming. I hear it. Just wait here a second. And it took another 15 seconds or so before we could see the line knocking the fire down in the, in the stairway. We were up in the attic, and we just rolled down. And they were like, where the hell you guys come from? But that was a, that was a good fire. It had a couple yeah. of ones like that. One you got that one, Gonzo? Yeah. Huh? Uh, I'm trying to see if I can find it in the uh, in the rest of. It. Remember, I can only load so many in here. So we look and see. Yeah, it. Was it titled 157? Um, Do you remember what it was titled? Building rocket and I were trapped in or got got uh, held up in something like that. Okay, because uh, I have all the way up. Flatbush Avenue. This thing is cranking. As we come out of quarters, come out of Rogers Avenue, do the S turn again onto Flatbush, and I can see we're four blocks away, three blocks away, and I pick it up. I just uh, 157 of Brooklyn, uh, 1075 the box. Is what he got 157. I said I'll let you know when I get there. That was too far away, but I knew it was a good job. Good job. Matter of fact, we went in there. It was me and Spanky and uh, Sean Taylor. George George O'Shea was Spanky. George Shea was Spanky. Phil, as a matter of fact, he's Phil Buffett's cousin. I didn't know that when I got there until later. And um, we go in there and we get we get down this hallway. It was a it was a mixed occupancy originally. It was commercial on the first floor, residential on the next two floors, but now it's all, all commercial. <clears throat> And we get in there, and the aisles are narrow, and we go down to one aisle, and then we make a left, we go down the next aisle, and they had a glass door there. As I open the door, I'm, I'm, I'm down low. As I open the door, the heat was tremendous. Boom, I shut it, and I, I said, okay, let's back out. We get to the doorway. Richie Smith is on the line, 255. Charlie Price is on the nozzle. And um, we start heading down the hallway, and as we get towards it, I says, Richie, it's, there's an angry fire behind that door. I says, it's going to come at us when we open it up. That's the one. We were trapped up on the top. You see where the bucket is? And above mm-hmm. the, those two windows, that's where we were up in there. And that's Rocket. Rocket is um, third one in from the right. So, uh, and that Georgie Shea is the fifth one. Sean Taylor's the fourth one. Right, that's Banzai over there after uh, Jim, after George, George Shea. And that, that's me, Charlie Resto, Dean, um, Batman. And that was a 30 day guy. I'm not, I don't remember who he was. Remember, they used to, not a 30 day guy that they used to rotate guys to the companies. Remember that? Yeah. That's who he was, a rotation guy. I don't remember his name now. So, I do. We sent, as a matter of fact, that building, when Richie went in, he opened it up. And now there was um, Richie, Charlie, I think it must have been Restiano after him. And then it was me and Spanky and Taylor. Well, when they opened it up, this thing came roaring out, and everybody dropped. We now we were on our bellies, and I says, "Everybody out of here! Everybody out of here!" So I followed the line back to the door, and I hear the guy screaming. I'm this way out, this way out. And I'm standing at the door, and I see them go by this way. They come. I'm like, "This way out!" They should have come this way, and they go this way. So I'm screaming, "This way out! This way out!" I'm waiting for them one at a time. They 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 come rolling out of there. They just come rolling out. They're smoking. They're burnt. They're in bad shape. And the only one left on this landing is George. George Shea, Spanky. I says, uh, you ready to take this on? He says, yeah, let's go. So me and him take the line. We get in there. We start falling, moving in, and we start knocking this fire down. And uh, the time she says, what the hell's going on up there? I says, I need a second line right away, chief. And they get a second line up there, and we end up knocking the fire down. And uh, five guys, I think, went to the burn center on that one. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that was a pretty intense fire. And what you said, Louie, about ruckus in the kitchen, let me tell you, old Jack Pritchett, let me tell you something about Jack Pritchett. He <laughs> will roll around with you in a heartbeat, a heartbeat. I saw him come over the table once, Bobby Hess. Was, I don't know what he did because I wasn't paying attention to him. I was talking to somebody else. Jack comes over the table next time. You know, they're rolling around on the floor and they're just fighting with each other. Nice. Jack, Jack Pritchard was one hell of a fight. And, you know, you either love him or hate him. You got to know him to love him. And whenever I worked with that man, I went out on drill, I'd ask him to come with me because no matter what I was teaching, no matter what I was drilling on, I would always learn something from Jack Pritchard. He was that kind of guy. Hmm. He really was. I'd like to get to know him too. Right? Yeah, if we're trying to get him on. I'd be mean, <laughs> calling a guy all the time. Yeah, you call him all the time. What's he say? Well, first he said yes, 
and now he doesn't pick up my call. So I don't know what that means. Exactly. I don't know exactly what that means. But I talked to him the other day. He said he'd do it. Five grand. <laughs> Ruffy, you got Anzo, it? get the cash. Get here we go. Anzo. I got it right here for him. I'll, I'll mail it to him right here. <laughs> oh. It's good in Florida, baby. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> right, we got to move to captain. We're getting a little late. So let's go uh, 2002. He spent six years there. 2002, you get promoted to captain. Uh-huh. Is that correct? And you wind up with a spot, UFO in 101. I was UFO in Red Hook. Well, I was UFO, and then I got a sign there without even knowing about it. I get a sign UFO to 101, and I call up Phil Burns. I don't know if you know Phil Burns. Dynamite guy, he's the sixth division, Brooklyn guy, really, really good guy, Phil Burns. Um, matter of fact, he does one of those commercials. He does the fruit and vegetable commercial, the pills. He's oh, is that him? That's Phil Burns, yeah, yeah. The, that's the balance of nature, yeah. yeah. Balance of nature. That's it. That's yeah, he's got the shamrock over here on his hand, right? That's him. The yeah. shamrock. Yeah. So um, I call him up and I say, "Chief, can I come to your office after work?" He says, "Yeah, yeah. Come on over, Tony." So I get in. I says, "Is this going to be a captain chief or going to be a Tony and Phil conversation?" Now, I know Phil Burns from my Brentwood days. That's where he he raised his family. He says, "Tony, what's up?" I says, "What Tony. did I do to you? Why'd you put me one on one truck for?" He's like, "Ah, ah, 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 ah." <laughs> I need a guy like you in a place like that. They're hurting. They lost seven guys. I need you to to put this company back together. No problem, Chief. I says, how much time do you want for He says, can you give me six months? I says, I'll go past September 11th. You know, because six months would have put me in uh, July, June, July, and uh, August. And I didn't, I couldn't leave then. Yeah, you want to leave like that. Yeah, I agree. Yeah, so, um, so he takes a heart attack about a month later. And this new guy just assigns me. So I call him up and I says, can I come over to your office? He says, no, I'll come to your house. So he comes to the office, to the, the firehouse. And uh, I'm like, what the hell are you doing assigning me? He says, why not? I'm the deputy. I says, but I got over 20 years on the job. You can't give me a phone call. I said, that's bullshit. You should at least give me a phone call. Say, listen, I'm assigning you. And if I don't like it, that's just tough shit. But you could have at least given me the courtesy of a phone call. We went back and forth a little bit. Then we were talking about boats and cars and kids and things like that. He says, if you want out, I'll let you out. I said, I made a commitment to Phil Burns. I will com- complete my commitment to Phil Burns. I just didn't appreciate being assigned and having somebody call me up and congratulate me. And I have no idea what the hell they congratulate me about. So I stayed there for a while. Um, and then when I called Chief Norman up <laughs> in October, I guess it was, end of October, he said, oh, I thought you wanted to stay in 101 because I saw you on the order. And I laughed. I said, okay, man, yeah, yeah. I, I get the day. I get Funny, it. man. Yeah. Hey, so, let me uh, ask you before we leave off for 101, did you work with Jack Gerber over there? Or was he gone? I do Big not remember Jack Gerber. But oh, for 101 truck, now, back in the 1800s, Columbia, South Carolina had a big fire, and they lost a lot of fire equipment, a lot of houses. They lost a major part of their city. Well, New York City decided to send an entourage of fire engines and firemen and everything else down to Columbia, South to Columbia, South Carolina. And they took care of the fire. They took care of the firemen, gave them some fire engines, equipment, and hose, blah, blah, blah. The mayor of that city says back in the 1800s, if we ever have the chance to repay you, we will. So 2001 happens. Some kid reading history finds out about this and says, it's our chance to repay the New York City Fire Department. Starts a collection. That's that's Jack Jensen. Uh, he's the he's the former chief of us, Columbia, South Carolina. Um, so this kid does all of the uh, pay, legwork and starts to get a fund drive going. All these companies get in and they have this whole big thing and they end up purchasing this um, Seagrave uh, tiller rig and donating it to the New York City Fire Department. Oh, and shit. Water water and they, they bring everybody up and have all these people from the schools come up and they have this big party. And it was a really, really thoughtful time. And, and they got to repay their debt somehow. Wow. Pretty intense, right? Yeah. I worked in 101 a few times. I covered there a few times. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's not a bad joint, you know, but it's a good place if you want to slow down because they don't do a lot of work. I had two jobs in the, in the eight months I was there. They're just stuck in the corner. You know, mm-hmm. they really are just yeah, stuck in yeah. the corner. So this is what made me decide it was October. I was going to try and hang in there for a little while longer. <clears throat> Sitting at my desk, it's 10 minutes to 11, put down my pen. I go and I do my thing in the bathroom. I put on my nighttime pajamas, my response pajamas, right? I get into bed with my cup of tea and I pull my covers up. And I turn the TV on. I wait for the news to come on. And all of a sudden, it's like, you fucking slug. Look at, <laughs> look at you. Me. You got you. <laughs> you I mean, when slug. I first got there, I was walking around the firehouse one o'clock in the morning. Like, where is everybody? Right? So that's when I decided I'm out of there. And I called the chief, and chief says, All right, welcome aboard. And then I called the man at the uh, special operations command, and they're like, Who? What? With us? I said, That's what Chief Norman said. He said, I'll call you back. So I guess he called Chief Norman to verify that I actually am in the command now. And um, 
He says, I got no place for you. Let me find some place for you. I'll figure it out. He calls me back and says, listen, boss, I'm really sorry. He says, I got to send you up to the Bronx. I said, no problem. He says, I'm sending you 19 truck. I'm like, who is this? I think they're breaking my horns. Yeah. Sure enough, I went to 19 truck. The only guy I knew there that was working, actually, I knew two, both the chauffeurs, Brendan Donnelly and Tommy Oswald, and everybody on the back step was the kid of somebody I worked for. Wow, uh, that's pretty cool. Yep, it was. I, every name on the riding list was somebody who had been in that firehouse before. Yep. Wow. And then wow. I go to Squad 18. I do a, a long vacation, like a three-week vacation there. I uh, have a guy fall. Do you know the manholes that have the cones on it with the steam coming out? Yeah. The guy falls in there, and uh, we set up a retrieval system, uh, the, the sentinel retrieval system. And uh, I get on the horn, and I tell him I got a guy. He's in a steam hole. I need you to shut the steam down. It's probably – I mix her off. I guess we'll mix her off. He's probably dead because he's, he looks like a lobster from up here. And uh, poof, the thing exploded, cops and everything. And La Femina negotiates with the – the police department, because they want to go, it's a crime scene in there, and the rescue, it's a fire department scene, that's what we got to do, so they negotiate two guys from rescue one and two guys from the ESU will go in there. Meanwhile, ESU shows up, I see a guy go to get in the hall, I'm like, dude, it's really hot in there, because I put my hand over there, like, whoa, I couldn't keep my hand over there, it's real. I got this, I got this, he goes and sits down, and woof, rolls backwards, later on I see him getting his pants cut off by EMS. Got burnt. <laughs> oh, he got burnt, <laughs> I know he did. So the chief tells me the plan, he says, that's bullshit. I says, we're set up. We're ready to go. It's our box. Mm -hmm. And he, he kind of admonishes me right there. I says, okay, you're the boss. I back away. I ask the guys what they want. I walk down the street. I get everybody coffee and a donut, a bagel. Cops eat donuts. We eat bagels. And, um, <laughs> bagel and rocks. You got nothing. So, yeah, so well, the dog was over, and he comes over now and starts bitching me out about having coffee and bagels. I said, you took my box. You took my everything away from me. I says, I'm standing here with my thumb up my ass. He says, I'll meet you back in court. So we go back there. And he starts breaking my bullshit in subordination. I said, ah, 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 time out. I'm not being insubordinate. I'm just giving you my opinion. I did everything you told me to do. I did not break any rules. I did not. I did everything you said I was supposed to do. I says, I don't have to agree with what you did, but what you said, but I did what you said. And he didn't like that. But either way, we got along well enough. Mm. And uh, there's a, a vacation there. And then Chief Norman calls me up and offers me rescue five. And I thank you, thank you, thank you. But it's 92 miles away from home. I said, I, I really didn't want to do that. I said, if something happens in the afternoon, it's going to take me three and a half, four hours to get there. Yeah. That's the spot. Then he offers me 61. And I didn't want to go back to the Bronx right now. It wasn't one of my choices. Because I, I gave him a choice of where I'd like to work. Can I, have, can I do that? He says, that's up to you. Okay, fair enough. Um, I said to him, I really want to bounce in the command a little bit more. Learn the companies, meet the guys, blah, blah, blah. And I guess it was maybe... A week later, Metcalf calls me and says, me and Metcalf, Metcalf was in 55 when I was in 19, we in the same battalion. We lived, uh, he lived in Mill Place, I lived in Mount Sinai. Um, we started for lieutenant together, we started for captain together. You know, Metcalf and I are longtime friends. He says, Tony, I'm going to the Rock, I'm done. He says, uh, would you take over the company? Absolutely. Fucking loot me. 252? Absolutely. So um, I guess it was a day or so later, Norman calls me up and says, uh, he says, I thought you said you want 252. I said, yes, man, can't go off it to me. I'd like to jump on that opportunity. He said, don't you want to bounce around? I said, chief, I've been bouncing around for a whole other week. And, uh, <laughs> <laughs> I'm exhausted. <laughs> it's all bouncing, bouncing all over the place. June 1, 2003, I walked in. That was never looked back, and it was uh, a great company. And my wife even said to me, she says, no wonder you like this place. They're all like you. They're all go-getters. They all want to go, go, go. They all want to work. They all want to go to fires. They all want to train. That's I love. Matter of fact, when I retired, my wife says, am I finally not the mistress? <laughs> she says, she's been my mistress my whole life. The final yeah. is my love. Yeah. So, no I, love I love the job. Yeah. Did you have to, it was it a uh, transition for you, being used to first do work, uh, coming in as a socks? Actually, no, because I was going to a lot of work. And being in the truck, you know, it's, if you're a squad, you're acting as a truck or a rescue. Right. I mean, you can act as anything. I've been assigned as a squad that chiefs and stretch a line. So I do, you know, whatever they do, whatever he asked for, we do. Um, but it, it wasn't a hard transition at all. I had actually um, was part of the founding group that started the Northern Brookhaven Technical Rescue Team Task Force back in 92 or three, um, which was because all those small fire departments along the North Shore of Long Island, none of them could really afford to man a full technical rescue team. So what we did is we uh, got the Setorkit and Stony Brook, Mount Sinai. Sound Beach, Miller Place, um, and we all got together and formed this group. And this group's going to get this, this group's going to get this, this group's going to get this. So you can initiate a rescue, just like a squad, right? We can initiate a rescue with the amount of equipment we have and the supports coming behind us as additional rescues and squads, right? So that's the way we kind of worked it on, uh, on Long Island. Mm -hmm. 
so I had the the knowledge of this. I still had to go to to uh, uh, rescue school, of course, which was great because it just freshened everything up. And um, I loved it. You remember the rescue school? And it was all the way in the back in those trailers. Yeah, in the trailer. Yeah. yeah, in the vacant lot in the back of the building. Back. Of a building. long way now. <laughs> you certainly have. Look at that place now. It's beautiful. Yeah. yeah, it is amazing. They did a good job. Yep. So 252 was a blast. I absolutely loved it there. The house was clean. We always keep the, kept it clean. We drilled all the time. Matter of fact, when, when we got the bailout ropes, when, when they issued the bailout ropes after, after um, Black Sunday, yep. well, before, the, before Black Sunday, I had actually asked every man in the company to get 50 feet of uh, 7 millimeter rope with some kind of descent device in a carabiner. And we're going to work on doing descent. Now, we would use anchor points, whether it be a, a hook or a halogen, even your SCBA. You could take your SCBA and put it underneath the window sill because it comes up in 90 and 90. You mm -hmm. get the necessary. The mask stays there. And as you're descending, you're looking up and your mask comes right off your face and you just keep going. So Black Sunday comes around. We, we finally, years later, we finally get our, uh, our uh, bailout ropes and we go to the rock. So I asked, they're going to train. And they said, yeah, we'll be around. We'll train this. They had the, the engine where the wall came down. So um, I called them two, three times and they don't come down. So we had that tower in the back, that wooden tower in the back that we used for special training. Now we're using it for bailouts. And um, a year later, they call us back to the rock. And uh, no big deal. I'm not thinking anything about it. But once they take our ropes from us, I know we're in trouble. So they call me up on the carpet, and I got like the battalion chief captains, lieutenants, firemen. They said, you used your rope. You used your rope. I said, yeah. And? What do you mean, and? You're not supposed to use your rope. And so um, I said, you guys said you're going to come around and train me. You said you were going to be there. You were going to train us. You were going to do this and that. I said, my men need to know what they're doing. I said, you can't expect anybody to go to a PowerPoint session for four hours and then do six slides and know what they're doing three months, four months, six months down the road. You can't expect that. You have to train. I said, my men have hundreds of slides, hundreds of slides. So anyway, they send me back out and they call me back in at the end of the day and they says, uh, if we give you ropes, will you stop using your personal ropes? I said, that's all I want, something to train with. But they be, every month for every tour day tour and night tour for six months at least <clears throat> we would go out and do 10 or 15 slides every single tour day tour and night tour and night tour day tour always because that's how you're going to get good at it so yeah. we do more slides and then we would do things like okay what if here you go that's perfect what if you have to bail out all we all have to get out the window in a hurry so we just bail out everybody bails out the window one after the other after the other and uh, that's what we do <clears throat> i love awesome. that. putting 252 together helping put it together because metcalf started it um, rebuilding that company was probably one of the greatest things I did. I just absolutely loved it because all they wanted to do was drill. All they wanted to do was hit better. All they want to do is be a better fireman. How, who yeah. can ask for more than that? All yeah. your want to be better than they are today, right? Yeah. Who can ask for more than that. And we how many it. how many guys did you need on the roster when you when you got there? Did you still need a decent amount I, of guys? I used to keep uh, 25, 26 guys on the roster because it was right. always somebody like. Matter of fact, one time we went to one of those captains meetings and. Norman said he wanted to bring the rosters down to 22. So I let it go, and I called Phil Rubelow. I asked him if I could come over there, and I says, you, you've been in the command a long time. I'm kind of a short time here. What are you going to do about the roster? He says, I'm keeping it just the way it is. I said, okay, it's fine with me, and that's what I did. Hmm. I kept it that way. Yeah, because there was always people moving around. Who's going to technical schools? Who's going to right. this school? Who's going to pro, uh, show who's for school? Who's on vacation? Who's on show for school? Yeah. Whatever. Yeah. And, what uh, was your criteria when you were looking at guys to come over? You had a set criteria. Well, you got to remember that in the beginning, we needed people. You know, there just just wasn't a lot of guys coming. I mean, I was looking for people like Mike Perone or 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 people like Banzai or or Keatley or Schweiger. I was looking for. Yeah, guys you weren't really getting the cream of the crop. At that, at, I don't want to say it that way, but you were getting younger guys. Let's Absolutely. say, right? I was getting guys with two and three years on the job. Right? They weren't even first grade five in some of these guys. Right. <clears throat> Which is good because when they turn first grade, they buy the meal. So <laughs> they uh. But I, I, I got these guys coming in. I can't explain it. It's an attitude they have. It's the heart they have. It's the drive they have. You know, mm -hmm. before they actually paid you to be in special operations, that's why they were coming in. They were coming in for the love of the job and because they loved it in their heart. That's why everybody came to special operations originally. Now people come for the money. And, right. and when Chief Norman said that we're going to get a 12% raise because it was special operations, I said, that's going to be the end of special operations as we know it. Mm. They're going to come for money and not for, for the desire in their heart. Yeah. <clears throat> I, I can't explain it. Military guys always got a preference because I, I'm a military guy. Military guys have a certain discipline to them. But even the non-military guys. But I had to go through a lot of guys. There were guys who were able to come in, bullshit their way past me. And then mm -hmm. once you get into the aptitude, I had another 
you remember the cement plant from uh, 101 truck I was talking about? I had this other place over on uh, Irving. And we go on the ladder, we go into the building, I come down, and it's a mechanical door there. So I take my screwdriver, I take everything apart, and I take the wires, and the wires are just hanging there. And I go, tap, the door goes up. Tap, the door goes down. It's perfect. I bring the apparatus in there, I close the door. We can drill in there all day long. We, we drilled a lot of hours when we first started because we had a lot of young guys. I'd say we're going out for drill at 10. We'd come back at 4. And sometime in the afternoon, they'd be like, Cap, we're going to eat today? I said, you fucking guys want to eat too? <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> right. They, they kind of nicknamed me the drill Nazi, and I didn't mind at all because we needed the, that kind of drilling. And by putting the guys through the motions like that, these guys showed that they had the capability, aptitude, and attitude necessary to stay in that type of an environment. And those are the guys who stayed. Matter of fact, one guy called me up once, and he, he wasn't really well-liked in the firehouse, but he calls me up after he retires, and he says, I just want to thank you for keeping me. I said, I kept you not because of your personality. I kept you because of your talent. That's why. I says, if you couldn't do the fire duty, then you wouldn't be here. I says, just because you're in the kitchen and you're breaking balls and somebody doesn't like you doesn't mean you're not going to stay. Right? Right. You have the talent. There's other guys who were able to talk <clears throat> way in but didn't have the talent, and I'd be like this, I'm sorry. you got to go back. Come back in the two years, three years when you get more experience. And guys would be like, well, what am I going to tell them? I said, tell them the captain sucks. I don't care what they think about me. Yeah. yeah. So yeah, we went to guys, but yeah, we had yeah. some really, really terrific guys. I mean, <clears> I've got <throat> calls from guys thanking me for putting them into the special operations, for bringing them into the special operations command, for giving them the opportunities that they mm -hmm. had. And, uh, I mean, there's a lot of guys from 252 out. As a matter of fact, Jason Bresler told, uh, I think he told my son just recently, that 252 puts more guys in the rescues than any other squad out there, I say. I think. Followed oh. by 288, of course. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. So, <laughs> would you say you were going through a decent amount of work there? We did. We did. It was, I tell you the truth, 252 was probably the slowest company that I was worked in. We were only doing about 2,400, 2,500 alarms a year. That's a bunch, you know. I mean, you know, yeah. from seven thousand and forty-two to uh, I don't know, maybe forty-five, five thousand in uh, in nineteen, and about that in one fifty-seven. You know, twenty-five hundred runs is a bunch. Matter of fact, one guy asked me once, "Would I ever leave two fifty-two?" I thought about it a minute. And I says, "The only place I'd leave two fifty-two for is Rescue 3. I said, "Why Rescue 3? I said, "Because they do less work than they squad do work one. Than we do yeah, when they squad get one work. Yeah. Right? Yeah, I mean, squad one's got a great run to work ratio too. The, squad one. Yeah, great run, run to work ratio. So, um, yeah, they don't, they don't well, even they think they do 2,000 runs. <laughs> oh, yeah? Yeah. I don't even think so. 500 runs a year. We're still getting 240 or so OSWs, you know. So it was it was a decent range. About 10% of our runs were fire. Right. That's, that's a good percentage. Yeah, yeah. You didn't work at every one of them, but you've gone through the most. No, of course not. No. And how about, I, I got to give you the busiest night I ever had. August 3rd, 2003, <laughs> the blackout. Oh, my God. I went to, if I'm correct, I went to 11 jobs in that 15-hour night tour, right? And Chris Gorwap and Charlie Moss were working a day tour. I think they went to nine more. Wow. That was a busy, busy tour, boy. Yeah. Wow. Imagine what this, the summer of 77 was like. <laughs> I couldn't that. even imagine. Oh, yeah. my God. They had more fight and they can actually have fire engines, I think. You know, there were guys working there, guys working there, guys taking work structure. I was off that night. <laughs> right, did you get year 77? I, I was no in uh in <laughs> 2003. <laughs> 77. Mm. I was, was lucky. Was good for your age. <laughs> Eddie, Cur Eddie Curley in 103 got, got a medal that night for making oh, no, in 2003. In 103, yeah, 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 there was fire <laughs> all over the place, man. <clears throat> Actually, at one point, the guy said because it was a hot night, and uh, the guy said, Boss, we need we need five minutes. I said, Not a problem. We sat on a curb. I says, whenever you guys are ready, you just let me know. They heard the 1075. We were on the curb for about five minutes, eight minutes. They heard the 1075. I looked at them. I says, let's go. They got up and ran. I said, okay, I'm in. There you go. Yep. It's fantastic. I'm I, wanted, over time. I see I'm way over time, guys. I'm sorry. No, it's all right. Yeah. I no, want, it's all right. I want to see Paulie. Uh, Paul McManaman? Yeah. Uh, yeah. You know what? Let's let's save that. We'll talk about the uh, old school health and safety tip. I'll tell I'll tell you. All uh, right. We can do that. We can do that. Guys, yeah. about the uh, yeah, Was there anything athletes. else you wanted to? Was there anything else that you had that you definitely wanted to talk about with 252? Anything else? No, let me tell you something. I can go on and on. I know. I know. Okay, so I'll, I'll give you the last thing I'll talk about with 252 is now I get hurt and they're retiring me, which is sudden. And, I mean, my lip was quivering when Giuliani told me I'll never go back to full duty. And I had um, the Chiefs. I was up at headquarters on uh, Metro Tech, and they were trying to get me to run a rescue school. And I was like, I don't want to drive back to Portsmouth Manhattan five days a week. So Andrew Dinkle, right, 
in Rescue One. He, he got a medal himself for picking somebody off for his stories in the air. Uh, he wants to do like an interview to me for the website. And one question he said to me is, do you have any regrets? I had to think about that a little while. And I, I said something along the line of like, there's things that I might not have done had I had a chance to think about it the second time. But the things that I did wrong also form the person I am today, as well as the things I've done right. So mm -hmm. if I change that, that might change who I am now. And I like who I am now. So realistically, I don't have regrets. Are there things I would change? Probably. Mm -hmm. But could, if I had to go back and do it again, I wouldn't change it because it created the person mm -hmm. I am today. Mm -hmm. And I credit, I, I can't even go through all the names, Amo Murata and, and Tony Alver. And I credit so many of these people, Richie Mills, Neil Taylor, with making me the fireman I am today, molding me and watching them and, and wanting to be like, when I go up, I want to be like that guy. Right. You know? But it was also guys out there whose names I won't mention. When I looked it over and I, I'd say like Dwayne Marshall and I worked a lot together. We studied in the firehouse together. I said, if I ever do something like that, just kick me in the balls. Well, <laughs> you, 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 that yeah. that you also need, forms who you are. You need to see are. those guys. You know, you need no, to but it also forms who you are. Because you're like, I'm yeah, not, never yeah, going to do that. that. Yeah, I, I would never, I would never do that. If I was a boy, you know, if I'm ever a, yeah. a chief, I'm never fucking doing that. If I'm a captain, I'm never going to do that to my yeah. guys. You know, so I had a chief once in Flatbush on the subway. You know, the um, in the subway in Flatbush, it's the end of the line. And there's conduit running up there, right? So I give my report, and this chief comes <clears> down, up and around. I'm not going to mention his name because he was a little pompous. And he comes walking around. He says, uh, uh, 4 1 to a uh, have him shut down the catenary lines. Uh, I'm standing there, I go like this. I go, Catenary lines? He goes, What do you call that, Lieutenant? I said, I call that conduit, Chief. And I just walked <laughs> <on. laughs> Catenary lines. Down the end track? What does he do? What's that? What is he riding the Amtrak? <laughs> no idea. It's, what the hell is it? Funny because this guy was buff, you know. He was buff, so he was willing to work it out and stuff. But, oh, he's one of those guys. So that's all I'll talk about with that stuff, guys. I can go on and on. I will say one other thing, uh, which just piqued my interest: the fact that you're happy with who you are now. A lot of people can't say that about themselves, so that says a lot about you. Like taking everything good and bad, and you're mm -hmm. happy where you are today, as the person you are. And I'm not perfect. Far, far from perfect. Believe me. Far from it. Yeah, off from, from it. it. Come off from it. I'd love to. I'd love to sit and chat more because I, I can tell you about the time I shut down the Buckeye Pipeline in all three airports. They call for they call for a part, part two. two. Right, so we might, we might have to go after you move down to Maryland uh, uh, to your farm. Where are you there. Maybe we'll, uh, I, mean, I could turn my computer and show you. My house is a wreck. It's yeah, once you get set, once right, you get so set up. Once we'll you have get you off for part two. We'll have you back. I guess that's the Tony True character rule that I actually got into the books on that one. No. <laughs> the uh, time I said to a chief, we had a, a tire, a fire and tire storm, and he's pulling everybody out. And I come out of the building. I says, "Chief, give me three minutes. I can get there." <laughs> and he looks at me. He says, three minutes." Danny Butler. I says, "Really, chief? Three minutes, and I can get this? Just give me a line in three minutes." He says, "You got three minutes." And I go in there, and sure enough, first we had to pass out propane cylinders. So I don't want to go into it. Go ahead. Go. <laughs> I don't want to go into it, but I do. <laughs> <laughs> I All right, guys, let's do the uh, health and safety. Stuff, Anzo. I love the job. No, and I we all job. do. That's it why shows. we're here, man. Remember, we remember that guy who said, what are you going to tell him when you're old, weak, and slow? Right? That's how no. I feel now. If I could go back to job tomorrow, I'd do it. But mm -hmm. I'm older, weak, and slow. And hopefully when they ask me what I did, and I tell them I'm a New York City fireman, it'll be enough. It'll be enough. It'll be enough. That's that it. is great. It'll be enough. It's a quote. Right right the, here we go. It play the. Uh... It's coming. Give it a second. There's is a little. It? Yeah, the uh, streaming audio has been giving us a little trouble with the, uh, with some of these ads. There's a delay. Yeah. I. That's what I was talking to Mike about to email StreamYard. The First Responder Center for Excellence is a not-for-profit organization dedicated to protecting the lives and livelihoods of first responders. Their education and research initiatives aim to bring greater awareness and understanding to the challenges to the health safety, and well-being of firefighters, EMS personnel, and other first responders, too. They are an affiliate of the National Fallen Firefighter Foundation. Uh, we're going to go a little off script tonight. We're going to take a, a personal note from uh, the cap here. We talk about health and safety tip. Uh, we talk about early identification. Uh, so cap had said in the pre-show I mean, uh, that um, that's the only reason you're alive today, right? Because you uh, what you had a medical and you tell us the story cap because we, we preach it all the time early detection i was uh i was getting three medicals a year two from the job and one from my volley house and uh about every four months i was getting a medical and i was fine one day and then i go to the next medical and i get a phone call from the medical office you go see a doctor right away 
And I, I don't remember exactly how the rating of prostate cancer goes, but out of a, a, on a, on a scale of one to 10, I was probably an eight, maybe a little over. So I go to the doctor and the first doctor said, pot psych, so change doctors. And I asked the doctor if I'm going to live or die. He says, I don't know. So um, I make a plan, right? Plan A, I live. We continue our life. Plan B, I'm not going to live. I build my own coffin and I have my funeral before I die so I can enjoy the party. But the bottom line is that um, that saved, the job saved my life because of those medicals. You know, I mean, all right, I had the symptoms of prostate cancer, but I, it wasn't registering. I'm like, oh, you know, it's just, it's, it'll go away. You know, it saved, the job saved my life by diagnosing me and giving me the operation and doing what they had to do to me to make it happen. Listen, it wasn't easy. I shriveled up. I got complete, almost bald with white hair. Um, but I'm alive because of those guys in the, in the medical office. My medical saved my life. There you go. So early detection, early detection, even when you're retired, make it your business to continue to go to the, to the trade center medical, even get a, a medical on your own. Ruffy's going, right? You're going to see. Um, I was just saying, we were talking with the cap, like you said, in the pre-show. I'm like, you know, I'm going twice a year. I go, you know, January, February with uh, Rob Brown. And then I go, you know, whatever, August with the job for the World Trade Center Medical. So I'm thinking, ah, six months, I'm good. Here you are doing three, you know. And in between a four month freaking checkup, like imagine if, you know, knock on wood, imagine if you weren't going, you know, doing that, like, holy mackerel, like, uh, and, and prostates, you know, if you're going to get one, that might be the one you want, you know what I mean? And, you know, the, the lesser of all the evils, right. It's, uh, you know, the most survivable, obviously, if you catch it early enough. So, uh, I mean, thank God, you know, everything is, uh, is working out well for you. Right. I yes, mean, everything's I good. Look at Paul McManaman from 252 oh. brain cancer and to watch him just lose everything about him. I, I sat with his wife, Jennifer, at, at the funeral and we talked. And she said the hardest part of this was that he wasn't my Paulie anymore. She called him Paulie. He wasn't my Paulie anymore. He'd say things in, in, that, that he would never, ever say. you know. And she just had to see through that because like the old saying, like the, the old man that goes to visit his wife in the hospital with dementia. And they say to him, why do you go visit her? She doesn't even know who you are. He says, but I know who she is. That's what Jennifer was. Jennifer knows who Paul is. Right? Even though he's going through this horrible thing in his own mind, she knows the Paul that she loves. And she was never oh, going to give up on him. Very sad story. So yeah. I, I just going to tell my quick story, too, with Paul, because I knew him from, you know, special op when he was 252, right? And, uh, and uh, when I was in 288. And then when... I got hurt and I was getting my operation and all that. I went back to, uh, I went to Sock Island, right? And he actually made a move, I guess, uh, you know, later in his career to drive the chief, the Sock chief, right? So he had like the best job. He was like a battalion aide, you know, and he just got to go to fires. You know what I mean? So we were in the same group together. Like they, over there, they did the ABCD. So we were in the same group. So I used to see him every 24, straight 24 as we did. And I used to see him all the time. And we became kind of close. And that morning, he was supposed to be coming in. And, uh, you know, I was the you know officer on duty, whatever. And I'm like, you know, anybody talk to Paul? Like, he, he, he was usually in by a certain time, right? So people started reaching out. And then we found out that he had gotten up to go to the bathroom and, uh, I guess, fell in the bathroom. I don't know all the specifics, but his wife found him and, uh, you know, ran him to the hospital. And they started doing tests. And again, like you said, one day he's going to fires and then the next day, you know, he had uh, a brain tumor. And do we have his picture, Gans? No, I don't think you know, so. You don't have it? No. I think I, I have it on my group. Facebook page because I remember when he passed away. If you find any group pictures over there, he's the guy that's usually standing next to me, makes me look like a uh, hobbit. Tall okay. guy, bald. Six foot four. Let me see. I but, have, uh, uh, no, not in there. Uh, that's 18. There, there he is. is. That's him behind the captain. Okay. Yep. He's six foot yeah. four. Monster of a man. Really Sweet good. Guy. Yep. You got uh, Chris Gorab, Dave Rodriguez, Cameron Peak, and Mike Oven that picture as well with Paul. Well, there goes your there goes your theory. 252 sends the most guys to uh rescues. Yep, yep. And yeah. uh like I said, see that's a car with no license plates. Don't park your car on the street, no license plates. <laughs> <car anymore. laughs> it's gonna become not, a convertible. Not when Captain <laughs> Carrot goes around, bro. Well, yeah, when Paulie passed away, that was yeah. uh that uh, you know, guys have passed away on the job and you know, you know people, but uh that one bothered me. I liked mm -hmm. Paul a lot. He was a sweetheart of a guy. 
another line of duty death related to 9 11. Yeah, no doubt. So, guys, please. Like, we just lost you... Nick Man. Well, Nick Mancuso didn't die from that. Nick Mancuso, former uh, union boss, just died this week, also. And, and somebody else just died. I think it was from the Bronx, wasn't it? Yes. Uh, oh, um, I, I forgot his name. It was like, what, two right weeks now. ago, right? Yeah. It was a couple uh, weeks ago. Yes. yes. Nick was on the so listen, for guys that are on the job still, you can go see Rob Brown. Or if you're retired, we heavily recommend that you go see Rob. He does an extensive workup. And know, does a lot especially of if he knows, uh, screening. Yeah, especially if he knows that you've been down, you know, at the pile. Uh, so just get the medicals, bro. Don't stop. Early detection. We keep blasting it over the air here. So you got to keep yeah. doing it. We do it every year. Yep. Well, Cap, you're moving out tomorrow, huh? Yes. God well, bless you. Move out. All right. So when you get all settled, give us a shout, and uh, we'll get you on for round two. And today is my grandmother's 109th birthday, if she was still alive. Oh, happy oh. birthday, Grandma. Happy 109. Birthday. I still Ooh. celebrate my parents and my grandma's birthday. All right. Wow, cool. Nice. Yeah. Hey, Gonzo's birthday. 108. You would never know it, right? <laughs> <laughs> hey, you son of a hey, bitch. Son of a bitch. <laughs> Look, I like you. <laughs> uh, all right, guys. So Monday is a little up in the air right now. I'm working on a couple of guys. Rufy's working on, so we'll surprise you over the weekend. And Cap, working on a few guys. You will, yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's maybe that's how you work on. Cap, on well, yeah. Yeah. Glad we finally got you on. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you for inviting me. I really appreciate it. Oh, we'll have you back again. Yeah, I'd love to good. come back again. I've got, like I said, I can tell you about the time I shut down at the airport. <laughs> and... You know what we can do, uh, Cap? Because we've been doing squad by squad. We get like three or four guys from. The squads. Yeah, maybe we'll get uh, we Metcalf just, and a couple of the guys. We did 270 and we did 288, so maybe we'll do a 252. We guys yeah, I like that idea. That's like. a good idea. I'd love to have a couple of the old guys with me. Tommy Rogers, the time he killed three animals in one day. I like Tommy <laughs> Rogers. <laughs> Tommy Rogers yeah. is a go-to guy. He is yeah. a go-to guy. Tommy Rogers is a great guy. Great yeah, guy. He's a good, he yeah, lives we, might have to, we might have to go find Norton and, and revive him. Oh. <laughs> I'm not. We're not dealing with Norton because he was tortured with the technology part. So, it was yeah, tortured. Oh, I'm not yeah. doing it. He lives he, right <laughs> down there. Maybe I'll have him come to my house. He lives right down the block. Oh, it was horrible. I'm not doing it. Horrible. Uh, yeah, all right, guys. Stuff. So uh, we'll see you on Monday. Uh, have a great weekend. Until then, stay low and go. All right, everybody. We'll see you at the big one. Thanks again, Cap. Thank you. All right, guys. Have a good night.